Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the double Uncom Award winning The Show Must Go Online, bringing you live performed readings of Shakespeare's complete plays with a global cast of all experience levels every Wednesday. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director, and creator of The Shakespeare Deck. Tonight's Julius Caesar will start in approximately 15 minutes time. Apologies for the later than usual start time. We were dealing with, with some unprecedented tech issues. Um, this is our 20th Shakespeare production and our 25th show in 20 weeks time. So the fact that new things can still surprise us uh, is a joy in itself. Uh, and please do beware the Ides of merch. If you would like to show your support, you can now buy TSMGO branded face masks, cups, and t-shirts together with throw cushions, clocks, and more. All proceeds will go to the Patreon Hardship Fund for all those who take part. And you can find details of our Red Bubble store in the YouTube description. Similarly, if you would like to contribute directly, we welcome all new patrons to our Patreon page. Um, our patrons receive weekly exclusive content including interviews, behind the scenes footage, deleted scenes, and more. You can find the links to that and to the, our Redbubble merch store in the YouTube description. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, remembering of course to hit the bell icon to receive all notifications. And remember to follow us at TSMG Online Live on Twitter or at The Show Must Go Online on Insta and Facebook. And now, to introduce the play this evening, brought to us as always by the magnanimous Ben Crystal, I have the pleasure of introducing not one, but two guest introducers tonight, Pfizer Qureshi and Andy Pacino. Pfizer is the Foundation Unit Coordinator for Murdoch University in Dubai, a university lecturer, academic head, teacher trainer, academic writer and researcher, and author of Books for Young People. Andy Pacino is a writer, poet, educator, filmmaker, part-time actor, artist, and former singer of Manchester band Lloyd Almighty. Together, they started Riyadh's only expat privately owned art gallery that made it to the top 15 places to go in Riyadh within three months of opening. Pfizer and Andy, the play is Julius Caesar and the, sh uh, blah, and the floor is yours. Hi everyone, thanks very much for this opportunity, Rob, and for allowing us to be a part of this brilliant production. And thanks also to the fab Ben Crystal for setting us up with the gig. Uh, it is a great honor and privilege to be involved and we are both really looking forward to today's performance. Yeah, uh, Julius Caesar is one of Shakespeare's better known plays and perhaps it's because it crosses both genres uh, of uh, tragedies and histories. Possibly the most famous production uh, on film, at least, and my personal favourite, came in the form of the 1953 shoot starring Marlon Brando as Mark Antony, James Mason as Brutus, John Gielgud as Cassius, with Greer Garson and Deborah Kerr as Calpurnia and Portia, respectively. Uh, two of my all-time favourite actors were in this production, Brando and James Mason. I love their distinctive voices. Both men are brilliant actors, although Brando, as he did in all of his films, outshines everyone in this one too. Um, did you know, by the way, that Brando absolutely adored Shakespeare? He also thought that the British did it best, which is why he spent so long on getting the accent right, although I think that Ben Crystal probably could probably have given him some better guidance on that one. Then there was the 1970 production that saw Charles, uh, Charlton Heston as Mark Antony, Jason Robots as Brutus, and again, John Gilgit, who played Caesar this time rather than Cassius. If you check the IMBD credits on this, it's quite funny. It says Gilgit played Caesar as John Gilgit. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Jill Bennett played Calpurnia, while one-time Bond girl Diana Rigg, also of Game of Thrones fame, entertained as Portia. Uh, talking of women, they don't play much of a part in this play, though both female characters in some way try to thwart the incident that, uh, that drives the production, which is the assassination of Caesar. I hope we haven't spoiled it for you there. Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, does her best to save him, and but for his ego, she may have done. Portia, too, does her best to get to the nitty-gritty of what's troubling her husband, Brutus, and perhaps if he, hadn't, uh, if he had confided in her, the murder might have never taken place, but we'll never know. Mm, good point. Um, okay, the play begins with possibly the best known of Rome's Caesars and his triumphant return to Rome uh, after a hard fought and won battle with his rival Pompey's children. Um, there are throngs of people lying in the streets, <coughs> excuse me, to welcome the victorious Caesar's return. Um, and the, the way the scene is set here is a demonstration of the, the, the chaos surrounding Rome at the time. Uh, there are loads of people gathered. Uh, it's an, an unruly mass, even to the point of, uh, heaven forbid, tradesmen not wearing their traditional clothes. Um, in fact, it's so unruly that the rabble even refused to listen to the tribunes uh, and at some point even poke fun at them. Um, a comparison could be drawn 
to uh, recent times that we've seen in the UK and the USA where the police have been ridiculed on camera and they stand by passively, although a little bit different circumstances, of course. Yes. While Caesar journeys on, one, one of the crowd, a soothsayer, sends him a warning, beware the Ides of March, which was a traditional deadline back in the day for settling debts. And of course, even before we see the play, we know that Caesar's debt will be paid in blood. However, he ignores the warning and continues with his victory parade. While this is going on, Brutus and Cassius are deep in conversation. Now, Brutus is a friend of Caesar's of, and, Cass and Cassius is not. But while they chat, Brut Brutus confides that he hasn't been quite himself and has nagging worries about the dark thoughts he's been having of late. Is this a hint of what is to come? Perhaps it is. Cassius placates him and mentions that the people actually see him as something of a champion rather than Caesar. Although Brutus is worried that the people want nothing more than for Caesar to be crowned king. Mm. Now, there may be a touch of the green eyes here as both men also agree that Caesar isn't any more of a man than those two are. And he is perhaps uh, even a little weak. Uh, as we'll see. Um, there are what were seen as, in that period at least, certain physical flaws uh, the men dwell upon. Um, when Caesar comes to see Cassius, he mentions to Mark Antony that he has doubts about him and doesn't trust him at all, mentioning that uh, he thinks too much and he reads. Although Mark Antony dismisses this, <coughs> excuse me again, and states that Cassius is indeed a solid character. Now, I think that many of us are likely to be able to, uh, to draw comparisons in our own lives here. Um, I'm sure we've all seen the boss that, we, you know, we think, how did you get your job? And you you really don't know what you're doing. Um, and so we, I, we can probably have a little bit of uh, sympathy with Cassius there. Yes, Cassius is a character we really have to watch. His intentions seem to be for his dislike of Caesar rather than anything out of jealousy. And as he's for Brutus's being a leader rather than for himself, uh, we can see his intentions are noble. Brutus's motivation has also only ever been for the good of Rome. And so while some might say he's deceitful, he's, it is really with the best of for Rome at heart. Confirming Cassius's honorable motive is that we, while he doesn't want to bow down to Caesar, he seems perfectly fine doing so in front of Brutus. Maybe there's not so much of the green in the eye after all. Cassius also uh, derides Caesar, calling him weak and affirming that Brutus is of, of noble birth and therefore more worthy of the title of a ruler. While Brutus is flattered by this, he's still in two minds and leaves to ponder his friend's remarks. Both men, however, understand that the only way to get rid of Caesar is to kill him. Mm. Uh, Brutus and Cassius then speak to Casca, who's another tribune, who recounts uh, to the men uh, that during the rally, Mark Antony's already offered uh, Caesar the crown a number of times and each time Caesar refused it. Um, after the third offer Caesar had an epileptic fit which supports Cassius' Cassius's theory that Caesar's not only mentally weak but also physically unfit for the role. Um, once Brutus exits uh, Cassius makes us aware of his plans in a soliloquy stating that he's prepared even by illegitimate means to sway Brutus further into his plot. That night, thunder sounds and lightning streaks the sky, a metaphor that signifies matters in Rome are about to erupt. Cicero and Casca chat about the storm, a midday owl hoots, and stories about people rising from their graves, all bad omens. As Cicero leaves, Cassius enters and indicates the omens are all point towards Caesar being, being the ruin of Rome. With this in mind, Cassius urges Casca to join him and Brutus in removing Caesar from power, and then brings more people in on the plot. Cassius then has Casca and Senna throw messages bearing rocks through Brutus's windows to demonstrate how much the civilians are really against Caesar rather than for him. And as more tribunes join the plot, Caesar's fate is sealed. Mm. Brutus is still at odds with himself over what he feels has to be done, but in the end he convinces himself that again, for the good of Rome, uh, Caesar has to go. Um, Cassius arrives at Brutus's home with the rest of the assassins and Caesar's fate is effectively sealed. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about this fact is that while all the men understand Mark Antony is a fervent Caesar supporter, Brutus stops short of ordering the double assassination uh, and we'll come back to this in a sec. Um, so while the storms brewing outside, Caesar's wife has nightmares, um, screaming the husband's going to be murdered. She sees the dream uh, as another omen that something's amiss and Caesar is in danger. He placates her, however, and decides that he will stay at home. Then Decius arrives and convinces Caesar to change his mind, testing his manhood and leadership characteristics. Caesar's ego gets in the way to Calpurnia's wishes, and he decides to continue with his plans to attend the Senate House. This is another example of him ignoring bad omens, and it's another example of his poor judgment, which the play is kind of littered with. Artemidorus enters, and once again, Caesar ignores yet another warning, again demonstrating an error of judgment. 
While one of the tribunes leads Mark Antony away, the assassination is carried out. In every production of Julius Caesar we've watched, the men dipping their hands in Caesar's blood, and th this scene reminds us of vultures or hyenas or jackals feeding on a carcass. It's really quite disturbing. Soon Mark Antony appears, and here we yet another we see another uh, error of judgment. When against Cassius' advice, Brutus allows him to address the masses. While Antony initially seems to agree with the traitors, he quickly alters the mood of the crowd, and this is where it really kicks off. Mm. So what we've seen so far is ego, misjudgment, and deceit. Right? So ego is Caesar's unwillingness to listen to soothsayers, bad omens, and his wife and Artemidorus' uh, mm. multiple warnings. Misjudgment. Brutus is of Cassius' plan in the first place. Mark Antony's misjudgment of Cassius when Caesar remarks of his distrust of the man and Brutus's subsequent misjudgment of Mark Antony. And finally, there is deceit, not only of uh, Caesar's tribunes, but also from uh, Cassius, where he led Brutus into his plan through falsehoods, all of which, of course, will ult ultimately lead to uh, civil war in Rome. Now, for me, there's also one final flaw, and a lot of you are probably going to disagree with this, but uh, cowardice though we won't spoil it for those who haven't seen the play by telling you how it ends. Back to you, Rob. Thank you so much for that fantastic introdu uh, introduction. <laughs> wow, it's a, off to a solid start this evening, isn't it? Introduction! Thank you so much for that introduction, Pfizer and Andy. That was wonderful. And now, dear Grandlings, the show is about to begin. So please remember to capture your reactions on social using the hashtag show must go online. And please enjoy William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Act 1, Scene 1, Rome in the street. Enter Flavius, Morellus, and certain commoners over the stage. Caesar! 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 Hence! 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 Home, you idle creatures! Get you home! Is this a holiday? Yeah. What? No, you're not being mechanical. You ought not walk on a labouring day without the sign of your profession. Speak, what trade art thou? Why, sir, a carpenter. Where is thy leather apron and thy rule? What dost thou with thy best apparel on? You, sir, what trade are you? Oh, truly, sir, in respect of a, a fine workman, I am, but as you would say, uh, a cobbler. <laughs> but what trade art thou? Answer me directly. What a, a, a trade, sir, that I hope I may use with safe conscience, uh, which is indeed, sir, a, a mender of bad souls. <laughs> what trade, thou knave? Thou naughty knave, what trade? No, 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 sir, I beseech you, uh, be not out with me. Yet, if you be out, sir, I can mend you. <laughs> what meanst thou by that? Mend me, thou saucy fellow. <laughs> Why, sir, cobble you. <laughs> Thou art a cobbler, up now. Uh, truly, sir, um, um, all that I live by is with the all. <laughs> uh, I, I am indeed uh, a surgeon to old shoes. Yeah? <laughs> uh, when they are in great danger, I... <laughs> Recover them! <laughs> oh, as proper men as ever trod upon neat leather have gone upon my handiwork. But wherefore art thou not in my shop today? Why dost thou lead these men about the streets? Well, tr truly, sir, to wear out their shoes and get myself into more work. <laughs> uh, but, but indeed, sir, we make holiday to see Caesar! 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 His triumph! Caesar! 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 <laughs> Wherefore rejoice? What conquest brings he home? What tributaries follow him to Rome to grace in captive bonds his chariot wheels? You blocks! You stones! You Worse than senseless things. Oh, you, you hard hearts, you cruel men of Rome. Knew you not Pompey? Many a time and oft have you climbed up to walls and battlements, to towers and windows, yea, to chimney tops. Your infants 
in your arms and there have you sat the live long day with patient expectation to see great Pompey pass the streets of Rome. And when you saw his chariot but appear, have you not made an universal shout that Tiber trembled underneath her banks to hear the replication of your sounds made in her concave shores? And do you now put on your best attire? And do you now call out a holiday? And do you now strew flowers in his way that comes in triumph over Pompey's blood? Be gone, run to your houses, fall upon your knees, pray to the gods to intermit the plague that needs must light on this ingratitude. Go, go good countrymen. And for this fault, assemble all the poor men of your sort, drill them to Tiber's banks and weep your tears into the channel till the lowest stream do kiss the most exalted shores of all. See where their basest metal be not moved, vanish tongue-tied in their guiltiness. Go you down that way towards the capital. This way will I. Disrobe the images if you define them decked with ceremonies. May we do so? You know it is the Feast of Lupercal. It is no matter. Let no images be hung with Caesar's trophies. Pull about and drive away the vulgar from the streets. So do you too, where you perceive them thick. These growing feathers plucked from Caesar's wing will make him fly an ordinary pit, who else will soar above the view of men and keep us all in servile fearfulness. Exeunt. Act 1, Scene 2, Rome, a public place. Enter Caesar, Antony for the course, Calpurnia, Portia, Decius, Cicero, Brutus, Cassius, Casca, citizens, and a soothsayer. After them, Morellus and Flavius. Calpurnia! This so Caesar speaks. Calpurnia! Here, my lord. Stand you directly in Antonio's way when he doth run his course. Antonio! Caesar, my lord! Forget not in your speed, Antonio, to touch Calpurnia, for our elders say the baron touch it in this holy chase. Shake off their sterile curse. I shall remember when Caesar says, do this, it is performed. <laughs> Step on and leave no ceremony out. Yeah! Yeah! Caesar! Huh? Who calls? Let every noise be still, peace yet again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue shriller than all the music cry, Caesar, speak. Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the Ides of March. What man is this? Soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Set him before me, let me see his face. That fellow, come from the throng, look upon Caesar. What sayest thou now to me? Speak once again. Beware the Ides of March. <laughs> he is a dreamer. Let us leave him. Pass! Hey! <laughs> ah! Ah! Will you go and see the order of the course? Not I. I pray you do. I am not gamesome. I do lack some part of that quick spirit that is in Antony. Let me not hinder, Cassius, your desires. I'll leave you. Uh, Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eyes that gentleness and show of love as I was wont to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. I, if I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself, which give some soil, perhaps, to my behaviors. But let not, therefore, my good friends be grieved, among which number, Cassius, be you one, nor construe any further my neglect than that poor Brutus, with himself at war, forgets the shows of love to other men. Then, Brutus, 
I have much mistook your passion by means whereof this breast of mine has buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. Tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other things. That is just. And it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye, that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, the mortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus and groaning underneath this age's yokes, have wished that notable Brutus had his eyes. And to what dangers would you lead me, Cassius, that you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me? Therefore, good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you yet know not of. Caesar, Caesar, Caesar. What means this shouting? What means this shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king. I. Do you fear it? Then I must think you would not have it. I would not, Cassius, yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it that you would impart to me? If it be off toward the general good, set honor in one eye and death in the other, and I will look on both indifferently. For let the gods so speed me as I love the name of honor more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favour. Well, honour is the subject of my story. I cannot tell what you and other men think of this life, but for my single self, I had as lief not be as to live to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I was born as free as Caesar, so were you. We are both fed as well. And we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once, upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Death thou, Cassius, now leap with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point. Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow, and so indeed he did. The torrent roared and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive at the point proposed, Caesar cried, help me Cassius or I sink. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder, the old Anchises bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I, the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god, and Cassius is a wretched creature, and must bend his body if ca Caesar carelessly but nod on him. He had a fever when he was in Spain, and when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. <laughs> Tis true, this god did shake. His coward lips did from their colour fly, and when that same eye who was bend doth all the world did lose his luster, I did hear him groan. Aye, and that tongue of his that bade the Romans mark him and write his speeches in their books. Alas, it cried, give me some drink to Tinius as a sick girl. <gasps> Ye gods, it doth amaze me, a man of such feeble temper should so get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. Another general shout. I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we, Petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men, at some times, are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus, 
And Caesar, what should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together, yours is as fair a name. Sound them, it doth become them nothing else but as gold. Weigh them, it is as heavy. Conjure with them, brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. Upon what means does this power seem to be that keeps grown so great? Her age thou art shamed. Rome has lost the breed of noble bloods. When went that by an age that the great church of the state was more than one man? When could they say till now that talked of Rome that her wide walks encompass but one man? Now is it Rome indeed and room enough when there is in it but one only man? Oh, you and I have heard our fathers say there was a Brutus once that would have brooked the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. That you do love me, I am nothing jealous. What you would work me to, I have some aim. How I have thought of this and of these times I shall recount hereafter for this present, I would not, so with love I might entreat you, be any further moved. What you have said, I will consider. What you have to say, I will with patience hear and find a time both meet to hear and answer such high things. Till then, my noble friend, chew on this. Brutus had rather be a villager than to repute himself a son of Rome under these hard conditions, as this time is like to lay upon us. I am glad that my weak words have struck but thus much show of fire from Brutus. The games are done, and Caesar is returning. As they pass by, pluck Caesar by the sleeve, and he will, after his sour fashion, tell you what hath preceded worthy note today. I will do so, but look you, Cassius, the angry spot doth glow on Caesar's brow, and all the rest look like a chidden train. Calpurnia's cheek is pale, and Cicero looks with such ferret and such fiery eyes as we have seen him in the capital, being crossed in conference by some senators. Casca will tell us what the matter is. Antonio. Caesar. Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men, and such as sleep a nights. Yond Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Oh, fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He's a noble Roman, well given. Would he were fatter. But I fear him not. Yet if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid so soon as that spare Cassius. He reads much. He is a great observer, and he looks quite through the deeds of men. He loves no plays as thou dost, Antony, and he hears no music. Seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he be never at heart's ease whilst they behold a greater than themselves, and therefore are they very dangerous. I rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear, for always I am Caesar. Come on my right hand, for this ear is deaf, and tell me truly what thou thinkst of him. You brought me by the cloak. Would you speak with me? Aye, Casca. Tell us what hath chanced today that Caesar looks so sad. Why, you were with him, were you not? I should not then, I should not then ask, Casca, what had chanced. Why, there was a crown offered him. And being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand, thus. And then the people fell a-shouting. What was the second noise for? Why, for that too. But they shouted thrice. What was the last cry for? Why, for that too. Was the crown offered him thrice? I marry was, and he put it by thrice. Every time gentler than other, and at every putting by mine honest neighbours shouted. Who offered him the crown? Why, Antony. Tell us the manner of it, gentle Casca. 
I can as well be hanged as tell the manner of it. It was mere foolery. I did not mark it. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown. Yet twas not a crown neither. Twas one of these coronets. And as I told you, he put it by once. But for all that, to my thinking, he would fain have had it. Then he offered it to him again. Then he put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very loath to lay his fingers off it. And then he offered it the third time. He put it the third time by. And still as he refused it, the rabblement hooted and clapped their chopped hands and threw up their sweaty nightcaps and uttered such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar refused the crown that it had almost choked Caesar. For he swooned and fell down at it. And for mine own part, I does not laugh. Fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air. But soft, I pray you. What? Did Caesar swoon? He fell down in the marketplace and foamed at mouth and was speechless. It is very like he hath the falling sickness. <laughs> Caesar hath it not. But you and I and honest Casca, we have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that, but I am sure Caesar fell down. The Tagrag people did not clap him and hiss him according as he pleased and displeased them as they used to do the players in the theatre. I am no true man. What said he when he came unto himself? But Mary, before he fell down, when he perceived the common herd was glad he refused the crown, he plucked me up his doublet and offered them his throat to cut. And I had been a man of any occupation, if I would not have taken him at a word, I would I might go to hell among the rogues. And so he fell. When he came to himself again, he said, if he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worships to think it was his infirmity. Three or four wenches where I stood cried, alas, good soul, and forgave him with all their hearts. But there's no heed to be taken of them. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. And after that, he came thus sad away. Hi. Did Cicero say anything? Aye, he spoke Greek. At to what effect? Nay, and I tell you that, I'll ne'er look you in the face again. That those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for mine own part, it was Greek to me. I could tell you more news too. Morellus and Flavius, for pulling scarfs off Caesar's images, are put to silence. Fare you well. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. Oh, will you sup with me tonight, Casca? No, I am promised forth. But will you dine with me tomorrow? Why, if I be alive, and your mind hold, and your dinner worth the eating? Good. I will expect you. Do so. Farewell, both. What a blunt fellow is this grown to be. He was quick metal when he went to school. So is he now in execution of any bold or noble enterprise. However, he puts on this tardy form. This rudeness is a source to his good wit, which gives men's stomach to digest his words with better appetite. And so it is. For this time I will leave you. Tomorrow, if you please to speak with me, I will come home to you. Or, if you will, come home to me, and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Brutus, thou art noble yet, I see. Thy honourable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Therefore it is meet that noble minds keep ever with their likes. For who so firm that can't be seduced? Caesar doth bear me hard, but he loves Brutus. If I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, he should not humour me. I will this night in several hands, in at his window throw, as if they came from several citizens. Writings, all tending to the great opinion that Rome holds of his name, wherein obscurely Caesar's ambition shall be glanced at. And after this, let Caesar seat him sure, for we will shake him, or worse days endure. Exit. Act 1, Scene 3, Rome, 
a street. Enter from opposite sides, Casca with his sword drawn, and Cicero. Good evening, Casca. Brought you Caesar home. Why are you breathless and why stare you so? Are not you moved when all the sway of earth shakes like a thing unfair? Oh, Cicero, I have seen tempests when the scolding winds have arrived the knotty oaks, and I have seen ambitious oceans swell and rage and foam to be exalted with the threatening clouds. But never till tonight, never till now, did I go through a tempest dropping fire. Either there is a civil strife in heaven, or else the world too saucy with the gods incenses them to send destruction. Why, saw you anything a, a common slave, you know him well by sight, held up his left hand, which did flame and burn like twenty torches joined, and yet his hand, not sensible of fire, remained in spot. Besides, I had not since put up my sword. Against the capital I met a lion. Who blazed upon me and went surly by without annoying me. And there were drawn upon a heap a hundred ghastly women, transformed with their fear, who swore they saw men all in fire walk up and down the streets. And yesterday the bird of night did sit, even at noonday upon the marketplace, hooting and shrieking. When these prodigies did so conjointly meet, that not men say, these are their reasons, they are natural. I believe they are portentous things, and to the climate that they point upon. Indeed, it is a strange disposing time, that men may construe things after their fashion, clean from the purpose of the things themselves. Come Caesar to the Capitol tomorrow. He doth, for he did bid Antonio send word to you he would be there tomorrow. Good night then, Casca. This disturbed sky is not to walk in. Farewell, Cicero. Who's there? A Roman. Casca, by your voice. Your ear is good. Cassius, what night is this? Oh, a very pleasing night to honest men. Who ever knew the heavens menace so? Those that have known the earth so full of faults. For my part, I have walked about the streets, submitting me unto the perilous night, and thus, unbraced Casca, as you see, have bared my bosom to the thunderstone. When the like open the breast of heaven, I did present myself, even in the aim and flash of it. But wherefore did you so much tempt the heavens? It is the part of men to fear and tremble when the most mighty gods by token send such dreadful heralds to astonish us. You are dull, Casca, and those sparks of life that should be in a Roman you do want, or else you use not. You look pale and gaze and put on fear and cast yourself in wonder to see the strange impatience of the heavens. But if you would consider the true cause, why all these fires? Why all these gliding ghosts? Why birds and beasts from quality and kind? Why old men, fools and children calculate? Why all these things change from their ordinance, their natures and performed faculties to monstrous quality? Why, you shall find that heaven hath infused them with these spirit to make them instruments of fear and warning unto some monstrous state. Now, could I name to thee a man most like this dreadful night that thunders, lightens, opens, graves, and roars at doth a lion in the capital? A man no mightier than thyself or me in personal action? Fearful as these strange eruptions are. Is Caesar that you mean? Is it not Cassius? I let it be who it is. For Romans now have thews and limbs like to their ancestors. But woe the while, our fathers' minds are dead, and we are governed with our mother's spirits. Our yoke and suffering show us womanish. 
Indeed, they say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a king, and he shall wear his crown by sea and land in every place save here in Italy. I know where I will wear this dagger then. Cassius from bondage will deliver Cassius. Therein, ye gods, you make the weak most strong. Therein, ye gods, you tyrants do defeat. Nor stony tower, nor walls of beaten brass, nor airless dungeon, nor strong links of iron can be retentive to the strength of spirit. But life, being weary of worldly bars, never lacks power to be done. If I know this, know all the world besides that part of tyranny that I do bear, I can shake off at pleasure. So can I. So every bondman in his own hand bears the power to cancel his captivity. And why should Caesar be a tyrant then? A poor man. I know he would not be a wolf, but that he sees the Romans are but sheep. He were no lion, but were Romans, not hinds. Those that with haste will make a mighty fire begin with weak straws. What trash is Rome? What rubbish and what offal when it serves for the base matter to illuminate so vile a thing as Caesar? But, oh, William, where hast thou led me? I perhaps speak this before a willing bondman. Then I know my answer must be made. But I am armed, and dangers are to me indifferent. You speak to Casca, such a man that is no fleering telltale. Hold my hand. Be factious for a redress of all these griefs, and I will set this foot of mine as far as who goes farthest. There's the bargain made. Now, know you, Casca, I have moved already some certain of the noblest minded Romans to undergo with me an enterprise of honourable, dangerous consequence. And I do know by this they stay for me in Pompey's porch. For now, this fearful night, there is no stir or walking in the streets and the complexion of the element it favours like the work we have in hand, most bloody, fiery, and most terrible. Stand close a while, for here comes one in haste. Uh, it is Sinner. I do know him by his gate. He is a friend. Sinner, why haste you so? To find out you. Who is that? Metellus Simba. It is Casca, one incorporate to our attempts. Am I not stayed for, Sinner? I am glad on. Oh, what a fearful night is this. There's two or three of us have seen strange sights. Am I not stayed for? Tell me. Yes, you are. Oh, Cassius, if you could but win the noble Brutus to our party. He can do content. Good sinner. Take this paper and look you lay it in the praetor's chair where Brutus may but find it. And throw this in at his window. Set this up with wax upon old Brutus's statue. All this done, repair to Pompey's porch where you shall find us. It is Decius Brutus and Trebonius there. All but Metellus Simba, and he's gone to seek you at your house. Well, I will hide and so bestow the pa these papers as you bade me. Are that done, repair to Pompey's theatre. Come, Casca, you and I will yet uh, day see Brutus at his house. Three parts of him is ours already, and the man entire upon the next encounter yields him ours. Oh, he sits high in all the people's hearts, and that which would appear a fence in us, his countenance, like richest alchemy, will change to virtue and to worthiness. Him and his worth and our great need of him, you have right well conceited. Let us go, for it is after midnight, and ere day we will wake him and be sure of him. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 1, Rome, Brutus's Orchard. Enter Brutus in his orchard. What, Lucius? Oh! 
cannot by the progress of the stars give guess how near today. Lucius, I say. <laughs> I would it were my fault to sleep so soundly. When, Lucius, when? Awake, I say. What, Lucius? Called you, my lord. Get me a taper in my study, Lucius. When it is lighted, come and call me here. I will, my lord. It must be by his death. And for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder, and that craves wary walking. Crown him that, and then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affections swayed more than his reason. But tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face. But when he once attains the upmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looking in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend, so Caesar may, then lest he may, prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing it is, the thing he is. Fashion it must, that what he is augmented would run to these and these extremities, and therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would as his kind grow mischievous, and kill him in the shell. The taper burneth in your closet, sir. Searching the window for a flint, I found this paper thus sealed up, and I'm sure it did not lie there when I went to bed. Get you to bed again, it is not day. Is not tomorrow, boy, the Ides of March? I know not, sir. Look you in the calendar and bring me word. I will, sir. The exhalations whizzing in the air give me so much light that I may read by them. Brutus, thou sleepst, awake and see thyself. Shall roam, etc. Speak, strike, redress. Brutus, thou sleepst, awake. Such instigations have odd, such instigations have been often dropped where I have took them up. Shall roam, etc. Thus must I piece it out. Shall roam, stand under one man's awe. What, Rome? My ancestors did from the streets of Rome the Tarquin drive when he was called a king. Speak, strike, redress. Am I entreated to speak and strike? Oh, Rome, I make thee promise. If the redress will follow, thou receivest thy full petition at the hand of Brutus. Sir, March is wasted fifteen days. Uh, it is good. Go to the gate. Somebody knocks. Since Cassius first did whet me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasma or a hideous dream. The genius and the mortal instruments are then in council and the state of a man, like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection. Sir, tis your brother Cassius at the door who doth desire to see you. Is he alone? No, sir, there are more with him. Do you know them? No, sir, their hats are plucked about their ears and half their faces buried in their cloaks, that by no means I may discover them by any mark of favour. Let them enter. They are the faction. Oh, conspiracy! Shamest thou to show thy dangerous brow by night, when evils are most free? Oh, then by day, where wilt thou find a cavern dark enough to mask thy monstrous visage? Seek none, conspiracy. Hide it in smiles and affability. For if thou path thy native semblance on, not Erebus itself were dim enough to hide thee from prevention. I think we are too bold upon your rest. 
Good morrow, Brutus. Do we trouble you? I have been up this hour, awake all night. Know I these men that come along with you? Yes, every man of them, and no man here but honours you, and every one doth wish you had but that opinion of yourself which every noble bears of you. This is Trebodius. He is welcome hither. This Decius Brutus. He is welcome too. This Casca, this Sinner, this Metella Simba. They are all welcome. What watchful cares do interpose themselves betwixt your eyes and night? As shall I entreat a word? Not the day break here? No. The buttons are dark, and yon grey lines that fret the clouds are messengers of day. You shall confess that you are both deceived. Here, as I point my sword, the sun arises, which is a great way growing on the south, weighing the youthful season of the year. Some two months hence, up higher towards the north, he first presents his fire. And the high east stands as the capital directly here. Give me your hands all over, one by and one. Us, and let us swear our resolution. No, not an oath. If not the face of men, the sufferance of our souls, the time's abuse, if these be motives weak, break off betimes, and every man heads to his idle bed. So let high-sighted tyranny range on, till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I am sure they do, bear fire enough to kindle cowards, and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women, then countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoke the word and will not palter? And what other oath than honesty to honesty engaged that this shall be or we will fall for it? I swear priests and cowards and men cautelous, old feeble carrions and such suffering souls that welcome wrongs. Unto bad causes swear such creatures as men doubt. But do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise, nor the insuppressive metal of our spirits, to think that or our cause or our performance did need an oath. When every drop of blood that's th that every Roman bears and nobly bears is guilty of a several bastardy if he do break the smallest particle of any promise that has passed from him. But what of Citrusbro? Shall we sound him? I think he will stand very strong with us. Let us not leave him out. No, by no means. Well, let us have him, for his silver hairs will purchase us a good opinion and buy men's voices to commend our deeds. It shall be said his judgment ruled our hands. Our youths and wildest shall know who it appear but be all buried in his gravity. Oh, name him not. Let us not break with him, for he will never follow anything that other men begin. But then leave him out. Shall no man else be touched, but only Caesar? Decius, well urged. I think it is not meet Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. We shall find him a shrewd contriver, and you know his means, if he improve them, may well stretch so far to annoy us all, which, to prevent, let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our course will seem too bloody, Gaius Cassius, to cut the head off and then hack the limbs, like wrath in death and envy afterwards. For Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let's be sacrificers, but not butchers, Gaius. We all stand up against the spirit of Caesar, and in the spirit of men there is no blood. Oh, that we then could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar, but alas, Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, let's kill him boldly, but not wrathfully. Let's carve him as a dish fit for the gods, not hew him as a carcass fit for hounds, which so appearing to the common eyes, we shall be called perjurers, not murderers. And for Mark Antony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. Yet I fear him for the ingrafted love he bears Caesar. Alas, good Cassius, do not think of him. If he loves Caesar, all that he can do is to himself take thought and die for Caesar. And that were much he should, for he is given to sports, to wildness, and much company. There is no fear in him. Let him not die, for he will live and laugh at this hereafter. 
Peace. Count the clock. The clock has stricken three. It's time to part. No, oh, but it is doubtful yet whether Caesar will come forth today or no, for he is superstitious grown of late, quite from the main opinion he held once of fantasy, of dreams and ceremonies. It may be these apparent prodigies, the unaccustomed terror of this night and the persuasion of his augurers may hold him from the capital today. Never fear that, never fear that, for I can o'ersway him. If he be so resolved, I can o'ersway him, for he loves to hear, he loves to hear that unicorns may be betrayed with trees, bears with glasses, elephants with toils, lions with holes, and men with flatterers. But when I tell him he hates flatterers, he says he does, being then most flattered. <laughs> Let me work, for I can give his humor the true bent, and I will bring him to the capital. Nay, we will all of us be there to fetch him. By the eighth hour, is that the uttermost? Be that the uttermost, and fail not then. Gaius Ligarius doth bear Caesar hard, who rated him for speaking well of Pompey. I no wonder none of you have thought of him. Now, good Metellus, go along by him. He loves me well, and I have given him reasons. Send him but hither, and I'll fashion him. The morning comes upon us. We'll leave you, Brutus, and friends, disperse yourselves. But all remember what you have said, and show yourselves true Romans. But gentlemen, look fresh and merrily. Let not our looks put on our purposes, but bear it as our Roman actors do, with untired spirits and formal constancy. And so good morrow to you, everyone. Boy, Lucius, fast asleep. It is no matter. Enjoy the honey heavy dew of slumber. Thou hast no figures nor no fantasies which busy care draws in the brains of men. Therefore thou sleep'st so sound. Brutus, my lord. Portia, what mean you? Wherefore rise you now? It is not for your health thus to commit your weak condition to the raw, cold morning. Nor for yours neither. You have ungently, Brutus, stole from my bed. And yesternight at supper you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across, and when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I urged you further. Then you scratched your head and too impatiently stamped with your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you answered not, but with an angry wafter of your hand gave sign for me to leave you. So I did fearing to strengthen that impatience which seemed too much enkindled and with all hoping it was but an effect of humour. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep, and could it change your shape as it hath much prevailed upon your condition, I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I am not well in health, and that is all. Brutus is wise, and were he not in health, he would embrace the means to come by it. Why, so I do. Good Portia, go to bed. Is Brutus sick, and is it physical, to walk unbraced and suck up the humours of the dank morning? What is Brutus sick? And will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No, my Brutus, you have some sick offence within the mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. And upon my knees, I charm you by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love, and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one, that you unfold to me, yourself, your half, why you are heavy, and what men tonight have had resort to you, for here have been some six or seven who hid their faces even from darkness. You not, gentle Portia. I would not need to if you were gentle, Brutus. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted I should not know any secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself but in sort of limitation? 
to keep with you at meals, to comfort your bed and talk to you sometimes. Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure. If it be no more, Portia is Brutus's harlot and no more. You are my true and honorable wife. Appear to me as are the ruddy drops that visit my sad heart. If this were true, then should I know this secret. I grant I am a woman, but with all a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant I am a woman, but with all a woman well reputed, Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded. Tell me your counsels, I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound here in the thigh. Now can I bear that with patience and not my husband's secrets? Oh, ye gods. Render me worthy of this noble wife. Hark, hark, one knocks. Portia, go in a while, and by and by thy bosom shall partake the secrets of my heart. All my engagements I will construe to thee, all the character of my sad brows. Leave me with haste. Lucius, who's that knocks? Here is a sick man that would speak with you. Caius Ligarius that Metellus spake of. Boy, stand aside. Caius Ligarius, how? Thou said good morning from a feeble tongue. Oh, what a time have you chose out, brave Caius, to wear a kerchief. Would you were not sick? I am not sick if Brutus have in hand any exploit worthy the name of honour. Such an exploit have I in hand, Ligarius, had you a healthful ear to hear of it. By all the gods that Romans bow before, I here discard my sickness, soul of Rome, brave son derived from honourable loins. Thou, like an exorcist, hast conjured up my mortified spirit. Now bid me run, and I will strive with things impossible. Yea, get the better of them. What's to do? A piece of work that will make sick men whole. But are not some whole that we must make sick? That must we also. What it is, my Gaius, I shall unfold to thee as we are going, to whom it must be done. Set on your foot, and with a heart new fired I follow you. To do I know not what, but I, it sufficeth that Brutus leads me on. Follow me then. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 2, Rome, Caesar's House. Enter Julius Caesar in his nightgown. Nor heaven nor earth have been at peace tonight. Thrice hath Calpurnia in her sleep cried out, Help ho! They murder Caesar. Who's within? My lord. Go bid the priests do present sacrifice, and bring me their opinions of success. I will, my lord. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar shall forth. The things that threatened me ne'er looked but on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished. Caesar, I never stood up. Ponies, yet now they fright me. There is one within, besides the things that we have heard and seen. A lioness hath whelped in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fight upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons and right form of war, which drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurled in the air, horses did neigh, and dying men did groan, and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets. Oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all use, and I do fear them. What can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. When beggars die, 
there are no comments seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. What say the augurers? They would not have you to stir forth today. Plucking the entrails of an offering forth, they could not find a heart within the beast. Will the gods do this in shame of cowardice? Caesar should be a beast without a heart if he should stay at home today for fear. No, Caesar shall not. Danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are two lions littered in one day, and I the elder and more terrible, and Caesar shall go forth. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We'll send Mark Antony to the Senate house, and he shall say, you are not well today. Let me upon my knee prevail in this. Mark Antony shall say, I am not well, and for thy humor, I will stay at home. Here's Decius Brutus. He shall tell them so. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate house. And you are coming very happy time to bear my greeting to the senators and tell them that I will not come today. Cannot is false, and that I dare not, falser. I will not come today. Tell them so, Decius. <laughs> uh, he is sick. Say that I am sick? Shall Caesar send a lie? Have I in conquest stretched mine arm so far to be afeard to tell graybeards the truth? Decius, go tell them Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. The cause is in my will. I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But for your private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know. Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. She dreamt tonight she saw my statue, which, like a fountain with an hundred spouts, did run pure blood, and many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And these does she apply for warnings and portents and evils imminent, and on her knee hath begged that I will stay at home today. This dream is all amiss interpreted. It was a vision fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in many pipes in which so many smiling Romans bathed signifies that from you great Rome shall suck reviving blood and that great men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics, and cognizance. This by Calpurnia's dream is signified. And this way have you well expounded it? I have, when you have heard what I can say and know it now. The Senate hath concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word you will not come, their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock apt to be rendered for someone to say, break up the Senate till another time when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper? No, Caesar is afraid? Pardon me, Caesar, for my dear, dear love to your proceeding bids me tell you this, and reason to my love is liable. How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia? I am ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. And look where Publius has come to fetch me. Tomorrow, Caesar. Welcome, Publius. What, Brutus? Are you stirred so early too? Good morrow, Casca. Caius Ligarius. Caesar was ne'er so much your enemy as that same ague which hath made you lean. What is it o'clock? Caesar, it is struck an eight. 
I thank you for your pains and courtesy. <laughs> See, Antony, that revels long a nights is not withstanding up. Good morrow, Antony. <laughs> so, to most noble Caesar. <laughs> Bid them prepare within. I am to blame to be thus waited for. Now, Cinna. Now, Metellus. What, Trebonius? I have an hour's talk in store for you. Remember that you call on me today. Be near me that I may remember you. Caesar, I will. And so near will I be that your best friends shall wish I had been further. Good friends, go in and taste some wine with me. And we, like friends, will straightway go together. That every like is not the same, O oh, Caesar, the heart of Brutus earns to think upon. Exeunt. Act two, scene three, Rome, a street near the capital. Enter Artemidorus reading a paper. Caesar, beware of Brutus. Take heed of Cassius. Come not near Casca. Have an eye to Cinna. Trust not Trebonius. Mark well Metellus Simba. Decius Brutus loves thee not. Thou hast wronged Caius Ligarius. There is but one mind in all these men, and it is bent against Caesar. If thou beest not immortal, look about you. Security gives way to conspiracy. The mighty gods defend thee. Thy lover, Artemidorus. Here will I stand till Caesar pass along, and as a suitor will I give him this. My heart laments that virtue cannot live out of the teeth of emulation. If thou read this, O Caesar, thou mayest live. If not, the fates with traitors do contrive. Exit. Act two, scene four, Rome, a street before the house of Brutus. Enter Portia and Lucius. I prithee, boy, run to the Senate's house. Stay not to answer me, but get thee gone. Why dost thou stay? To know my errand, madam. I would have had thee there and here again, ere I can tell thee what thou shouldst do there. <sighs> oh, Constancy, be strong upon my side. Set a huge mountain between my heart and tongue. I have a man's mind, but a woman's might. How hard it is for women to keep counsel. Art thou here yet? Madam, what should I do? Run to the capital and nothing else, and so return to you and nothing else. Yes, bring me word, boy, if thy lord look well, for he went sickly forth, and take good note what Caesar doth, what suitors press to him. Hark, boy, what noise is that? I hear none, madam. No, no, prithee, listen well. I had a bustling rumour, like a fray, and the wind brings it from the capital. Sooth, madam, I hear nothing. Come hither, fellow. Which way hast thou been? At mine own house, good lady. What is it o'clock? About the ninth hour, lady. Is Caesar yet gone to the capital? Madame, not yet. I go to take my stand to see him pass on to the capital. Thou hast some suit to Caesar, hast thou not? That I have, lady. If it will please Caesar to be so good to Caesar as to hear me, I shall beseech him to befriend himself. Why, knowest thou any harm intended towards him? None that I know will be, much that I fear may chance. Good morrow to you. Here the street is narrow. The throng that follows Caesar at the heels of senators, of praetors, common suitors, will crowd a feeble man almost to death. I'll get me to a place more void, and there speak to great Caesar as he comes along. Oh, I must go and I me. How weak a heart the woman is. And Brutus, the heavens speed thee in thine enterprise. Sure, the boy heard me. Brutus hath a suit that Caesar will not grant. I grow faint. Say I am merry, and come to me again, and bring me word what he doth say to thee. Exeunt severally. Act three, scene one, Rome, before the capital, the senate sitting above. Enter Caesar, Brutus, Cassius, Casca, Decius, Metellus, Trebonius, Cinna, Antony, Lepidus, Artemidorus, Publius, Papilius, and the soothsayer. The Ides of March are come. Aye, Caesar, but not gone. Caesar, read this schedule. 
Bonius doth desire you to all read at your best leisure this his humble suit. O oh, Caesar, read mine first, for mine's a suit that touches Caesar nearer. Read it, great Caesar. What touches ourself shall be last served. Uh, delay not, Caesar, read it instantly. Shut up, mad. Caesar, give place. Oh, what, add your petitions in the street. Come to the capital. <sighs> I wish your enterprise today may thrive. <laughs> what enterprise, Papilius? <laughs> Fare you well. What said Papilius letter? He wished today our enterprise might thrive. I fear our purpose is discovered. Look how he makes to Caesar, mark him. Oh, Gasca, be sudden, for we fear propension. Brutus, what shall we be done? If this be known, Cassius or Caesar shall never turn back, for I will slay myself. Cassius, be constant. Papilius, Lena speaks not of our purposes, for Loki smiles and Caesar doth not change. <sighs> Trebonius knows his time, for look, you Brutus, he draws Mark Antony out of the way. Where is Metellus Timber? Let him go and presently prefer his suit to Caesar. He is addressed. Press near and second him. Casca, you are the first that rears your hand. Are we all ready? What is now amiss that Caesar and his Senate must redress? Most high, most mighty, and most puissant, Caesar. Metellus Simber throws before thy seat and humble heart. I must prevent thee, Simber. These couchings and these lowly courtesies might fire the blood of ordinary men and turn preordinance and first decree into the law of children. Be not fond to think that Caesar bears such rebel blood that will be thawed from the true quality with that which melteth fools. I mean sweet words, low crooked curtsies, and base spaniel fawning. Thy brother by decree is banished. If thou dost bend and pray and fawn for him, I spurn thee like a cur out of my way. No, Caesar doth not wrong nor without cause will he be satisfied. Is there no voice more worthy than my own to sound more sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother? I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar, desiring thee that Publius Simber may have an immediate freedom of repeal. What, Brutus? A pardon, Caesar, Caesar pardon. As low as to thy foot does Cassius fall to beg enfranchisement for Publius Simba. I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me. But I am constant as the northern star, of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. The skies are painted with unnumbered sparks. They are all fire and every one doth shine. But there's but one in all doth hold his place. So in the world, tis furnished well with men, and men of flesh and blood and apprehensive. Yet in the number I do know but one that unassailable holds on his rank, unshaped of motion. And that I am he, let me a little show it even in this, that I was constant Simba should be banished, and constant do remain to keep him so. O oh, Caesar, hence wilt thou lift up Olympus? Great Caesar. Doth not Brutus bootless kneel? Speak hands for me. <sighs> oh. <laughs> Et tu, Brute. And fall, Caesar. Liberty! Freedom! Tyranny is dead! Run! Hence proclaim quiet about the streets! Some to the common pulpit and cry out, Liberty, freedom, and enfranchisement! People and senators, be not affrighted. Fly not, stand still. Ambition's debt is paid. Go to the pulpit, Brutus. And Cassius, too. Where's Publius? Yeah, quite confounded with this mutiny. Stand fast together, lest some friend of Caesar's should chance. 
talk not of standing, Publius, good cheer. There is no harm intended to your person, nor to no Roman else. So tell them, Publius. And leave us, Publius, lest the people rushing on should do your age some mischief. Do so, and let no man abide this deed but we, the doers. Where is Antony? Fled to his house amazed, men, wives, and children stare, cry out, and run as it were doomsday. Fates, we will know your pleasures. That we shall die, we know, <laughs> is but the time and drawing days out that men stand upon. Why, he that cuts off twenty years of life, cuts off so many years of fearing death. Grant that, and then is death a benefit. So are we Caesar's friends that thus have abridged his time of fearing death. Stoop, Romans, stoop, and let us bathe our hands in Caesar's blood up to the elbows and besmear our swords. Then walk we forth, even to the marketplace, and waving our red weapons in our hands, let's all cry, peace, freedom, liberty. Stoop then and wash. How many ages shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn and accents yet unknown? How many times shall Caesar bleed in sport that now on Pompey's basis lies along no worthier than the dust? So oft as that shall be, so oft that the not of us be called the men that gave their country liberty. What shall we forth? <laughs> Aye, every man away. Brutus shall lead, and we shall grace his heels with the most boldest and best heart of Rome. Soft, who comes here? <laughs> Friend of Antony's. Thus, Brutus, did my master bid me kneel. Thus did Mark Antony bid me fall down. And being prostrate, thus he bade me say, Brutus is noble, wise, valiant and honest. Caesar was mighty, bold, royal and loving. Say, I love Brutus and I honour him. Say I, fear Caesar, honoured him and loved him. If Brutus will vouchsafe that Antony may safely come to him and be resolved and how Caesar hath deserved to lie in death, Mark Antony shall not love Caesar dead so well as Brutus living, but will follow the fortunes and affairs of noble Brutus through the hazards of this untrod state. With all true faith, so says my master Antony. Thy master is a wise and valiant Roman. I never thought him worse. Tell him, so please him come unto this place. He shall be satisfied, and by mine honour he shall depart untouched. I'll fetch him presently. I know that we shall have him well to friend. I wish we may, but yet I have a mind that fears him much, and my misgiving still falls shrewdly to the purpose. But here comes Antony. Welcome, Mark Antony. Mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests Glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure. Fare thee well. I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. Who else must be let blood? Who else is rank? If I myself, there is no hour so fit as Caesar's death's hour, nor no instrument of half that worth as those your swords made rich with the most noble blood of all this world. I do beseech thee, if you bear me hard, now, whilst your purpled hands do reek and smoke, fulfill your pleasure. Live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die. No place will please me so, no mean of death as here by Caesar, and by you cut off the choice and master spirits of this age. Oh, Antony, beg not your death of us. Though now we must appear bloody and cruel, as by our hands and this our present act you see we do, yet you see but our hands, and this the bleeding business they have done. Our hearts you see not, they are pitiful. And pity to the general wrong of Rome, as fire drives out fire, so pity, pity, hath done this deed on Caesar. 
For your part, to you our swords have leaden points, Mark Antony. Our arms, in strength of malice, and our hearts of brother's temper, do receive you in with all kind love, good thoughts, and reverence. Your voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities. Only be patient till we have appeased the multitude, beside themselves with fear, and then we will deliver you the cause why I, that did love Caesar when I struck him, have thus proceeded. I doubt not your wisdom. Let each man render me his bloody hand. First, Marcus Brutus, I will shake with you. Next, Gaius Cassius, do I take your hand? Now, Decius Brutus, yours. Now, yours, Metellus, yours, Senna, and my valiant Casca, yours. Though now, last, not least in love, yours, good Trebonius. Gentlemen, all, alas, what, what shall I say? My credit stands now on such slippery ground that one of two bad ways you must conceit me, either a coward or a flatterer. That I did love thee, Caesar, tis true. If then thy spirit look down upon us now, shall it not grieve thee dearer than thy death to see thy Antony making his peace, shaking the bloody fingers of thy foes most noble? in the presence of thy cause. Had I as many eyes as thou hast wounds, weeping as fast as they stream forth thy blood, it would become me better than to close in terms of friendship with thine enemies. Pardon me, Julius. Here wast thou bade, brave heart. Here didst thou fall, and here thy hunters stand, signed in thy spoil, and crimsoned in thy lethe. Oh, well, thou wast the forest to this heart, and is indeed, a oh, world well, the heart of thee. How, like a deer struck by many princes, dost thou here lie? Mark Antony. Ja, pardon me, Gaius Cassius. The enemies of Caesar shall say this. Then, in a friend, it is called modesty. I blame you not for praising Caesar so. But what compact mean you to have with us? Will you be pricked in number of our friends? Or shall we on and not depend on you? Therefore I took your hands, but was indeed swayed from the point by looking down on Caesar. Friends, am I with you all and love you all upon this hope that you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Or else were this a savage spectacle. Our reasons are so full of good regard that you were you, Antony, the son of Caesar. You should be satisfied. Th that is all I seek, and am moreover suitor that I may produce his body to the marketplace, and in the pulpit, as becomes a friend, speak in the order of his funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Uh, Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Antony speaks in his funeral. Know you how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter? By your pardon, I will myself into the pulpit first and show the reason of our Caesar's death. What Antony shall speak, I will protest he speaks by leave and by permission. And that we are contented, Caesar shall have all true rites and lawful ceremonies. Shall advantage more than do us wrong. I know not what may fall, I like it not. Mark Antony, here take you Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us but speak all good you can devise of Caesar, and say you do it by our permission. Else you shall you not have any hand at all about his funeral, and you shall speak in the same pulpit whereto I am going after my speech is ended. Be it so, I do desire no more. Prepare the body then, and follow us. Oh, pardon me thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy which, like dumb mouths, 
to ope their ruby lips, to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. Blood and destruction shall be so in use, and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war. All pity choked with custom of fell deeds, and Caesar's spirit ranging for revenge with Ate by his side come hot from hell shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial you serve octavius caesar do you not i, I do mark antony caesar did right for him to come in rome he did receive his letters and is coming, and bid me say to you by word of mouth. Oh, Caesar. Thy heart is big. Get thee apart and weep. <laughs> Passion, I see, is catching for mine eyes, seeing those beads of sorrow stand and thine begin to water. Is thy master coming? Uh, uh, he lies tonight within seven leagues of Rome. <laughs> Post back with speed and tell him what hath chanced. Here is a mourning Rome, a dangerous Rome. No Rome for safety for Octavius yet. Hi hence and tell him so. Yet, yet, stay a while. Thou shalt not back till I have borne this course into the marketplace. There shall I try in my oration how the people take the cruel issue of these bloody men. According to the which thou shalt discourse to young Octavius of the state of things. Lend me your hand. Exeunt with Caesar's body. Act three, scene two, the forum. Enter Brutus and Cassius with the plebeians. We will be satisfied. We will be satisfied. Satisfaction. Then, then follow me and give me audience, friends. Cassius, go you to the other street and part the numbers. Those that will hear me speak, let him stay here. Those that will follow Cassius, go with him and public reasons shall be rendered of Caesar's death. I will hear Brutus speak. I will hear Cassius and compare their reasons when severally we hear them render it. Oh, no Satisfaction! Silence. Be patient till the last. Romans, countrymen and lovers, hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for mine honor and have respect to mine honor that you may believe. Censure me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may be the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus' love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who here is so base that would be a bondman? If any speak, for him have I offended? Who here is so rude that would not be a Roman? For any speak, for him have I offended? Who here is so vile that will not love his country? If any speak for him, have I offended? I pause for a reply. None. 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 none? Then none have I offended. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. 
The question of his death is enrolled in the capital, his glory not extenuated wherein he was worthy, nor his offenses enforced for which he suffered death. Here comes his body, mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the commonwealth, as which of you shall not. With this I depart, that as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have that same dagger for myself when it shall please my country to need my death. Live, 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 live Brutus, live, 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 live. Bring him with triumph home unto his house. Give him a statue with his ancestors. Let him be Caesar. Caesar's better parts shall be crowned in Brutus. You'll bring him to his house with shouts and clamors. My country. Aye. Peace, peace. Brutus speaks. Peace home. Good countrymen, let me depart alone and for my sake stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse and grace his speech, tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make. I do entreat you not a man depart, save I alone, till Antony have spoke. Say ho, let us hear Mark Antony. Let him go up into the public chair, we'll hear him. Noble Antony, go up. For Brutus' sake, I am beholding to you. What does he say of Brutus? He says for Brutus' sake he finds himself beholding to us all. To a best he speak no harm of Brutus here. This Caesar was a tyrant. Nay, that's certain. We are blessed that Rome is rid of him. Peace, peace. Let us hear what Antony has to say. Nay, nay, nay. 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 So, you gentle Let Romans. Let us hear him. You gentle Romans, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often terrored with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it were a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. Why? 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 All honorable men. Why? 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 I to speak in Caesar's funeral. It was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. man. An honorable man. They have brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. man. An honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but I am here to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts and men have lost their reason, bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar and I must pause till it come back to me. I think there is much reason in his sayings. Consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Has he, masters? I fear there will a worse come in his place. Oh, gee, his words. He would not take the crown, therefore, tis certain he's not ambitious. If it be found so, 
Some will dare abide it. Sol, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. Now mark him, he, be he begins to speak again. But yesterday, the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now he lies there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. No! Ah, I this. will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. Honorable men! Oh, yes! yes! No! But here, this a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet as his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read, and they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood, yea, beg a hair of him for memory and die it, mention, dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. We'll hear the will. Will. The will, the will. The will. The will. We will have, hear well. have, pa will. have patience, gentle friends, I must not read it. It is not meet. You know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood. You are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. It will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs. For if you should, oh, what would come of it? Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have overshot myself to tell you it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I, I do fear it. <laughs> they were traitors, honorable men. Will, the will. The will. The will. You will compel no, me then. You will the compel will. me then to read the will. Then Make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? And will you give me leave? Come down, down, down. come down, Antony. You shall have leave. A ring, stand round. Stand from the hearse, uh, stand from the body. Room for Antony, make room, most noble Antony. No, press not so upon me, stand far off. Stand back, room, 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 stand far off. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent. That day he overcame the Nervii. <laughs> Look, in this place ran Cassius's dagger through. And see what an envious, what a rent the envious Casca made. And through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed. And, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it. As if rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, ingratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him. Then burst his mighty heart. And in his mantle, muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now, now you weep. And I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what? Weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded. Look you here. Ah! 
Here is himself, marred as you see with traitors. It's a woeful day. That is fine. We will be revenged. Let not Seek. a traitor live. Stay, countrymen. Stay. Stay. countrymen. We'll hear him. We'll follow him. We'll Seek. die with him. Friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honourable. What slave what yes. private deal set up? Private they have, yes. alas, I know not that made them do it. They are wise and honourable and will no doubt with reasons answer you. Reasons? Lies. Lies. Lies! I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is. But as you all know me, a plain, blunt man. The love my friend, and that they knew full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. Aye! I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds. Poor, poor dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Anthony, there were an Anthony, would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to mutiny. Will you Will mutiny? mutiny? Will mutiny? In the hearts of Brutus! <laughs> Come, away, seek ah. the conspirators! I... Yet hear me, countrymen, yet hear me speak! Peace ho! Hear Antony! Most noble Antony! Why, friends, you, you go to do you know not what. Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your loves? Alas, you know not. I must tell you then, you have forgot the will I told you of. Oh, the, will. the will! The will! The will! The will! Stay in here, the will. The will. Here is the will. the will. And under Caesar's seal, to every Roman citizen he gives, to every man, several man, 75 drachmas. Oh, oh, Caesar. We will oh, avenge Caesar. his death. Oh, Caesar. Me with Moreover, he hath left you all his walks, his private arbors, his new plant orchards on this side Tiber. He hath left them you. And to your heirs for ever common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. When comes such another? Never. 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 Oh. Never. Come, come away. We'll burn his body in the holy place. Aye. Aye. And with the brands, fire the traitors' houses. Yeah. Ah, fire. 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 Fetch fire. Put down business. Ah. Put down forms, houses, anything. <laughs> <laughs> away. Now let it work. Mischief thou art afoot. Take thou what course thou wilt. How now, fellow? Sir, uh, Octavius is already come to Rome. Where is he? He and Lepidus are at Caesar's house. And thither will I straight to visit him. He comes upon a wish. Fortune is merry, and in this mood will give us anything. I, I heard him say Brutus and Cassius are rid like madmen through the gates of Rome. Belike they had some notice of the people, how I had moved them. Bring me to Octavius. Exeunt. Act 3, Scene 3. Rome, the street. Enter Cinna, the poet, and after him, the plebeians. I dreamt tonight that I did feast with Caesar, and things unluckily charged my fantasy. I have no will to wander forth of doors, yet something leads me forth. What is your name? Whither are you going? Where do you dwell? Are you a married man or a bachelor? Answer every man directly. Aye, and briefly. Aye, and wisely. Aye, and truly, you were best. What is my name? Whither am I going? Where do I dwell? Am I a married man or a bachelor? Then to answer every man directly and briefly, wisely and truly, wisely, I say I am a bachelor. That's as much to say they are fools that marry. 
Now you bear me a bang for that, Sophia. Proceed directly. Directly, I am going to Caesar's funeral. As a friend or an enemy? As a friend. Well, that matter is answered directly. For your dwelling, briefly. Briefly, I dwell by the capital. Your name, sir, truly. Truly, my name is Sinner. Get him to pieces! He's a conspirator! <laughs> oh, I'm Sinner the poet! I'm Sinner the poet! <laughs> Tear him for his bad verses! Tear him for his bad verses! <laughs> Tear him! Tear him! Oh. Come! Come! Firebrands! Ho! Oh, to oh. Brutus's! Cassius's! Burn all, some to Decius's house, and some to Casca's, some to Ligarius's. Away! Go! Exeunt all the plebeians, dragging off Sinner. Ladies and gentlemen, this is now your five minute interval. You have five minutes to refresh your drinks, refresh yourselves uh, and get uh, ready for the second half. So actors, if I can ask you to retire to the backstage area, please. Thank you so much. Uh, you now have five minutes to uh, refresh yourselves ahead of the second half. Thank you so much for joining us so far. Remember, if you have any questions for either uh, myself or the production team, please do feel free to let us know what they are in the live chat and we will endeavor to answer some of them. Hi there, Sarah, how are you doing? Good, thank you. <laughs> oh, what a show. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, yes. It's all uh, all hands on deck tonight. Plenty of uh, eventful and unprecedented occasions, but there is no better play for that indeed uh, than Julius Caesar. Uh, plenty of supernatural spirits going on within the play, and it appears there might be some supernatural gremlins within the Zoom as well. But that's all good. The actors are doing an incredible job so far, and I personally can't wait for the second half. Um, do you have an update for us, Sarah, from our Patreon subscribers? Uh, yes, I do. So, um, again, as always, thank you so, so much to everyone who continues to support the project. It means so much to everyone involved. Um, I've got a few names to shout out uh, for this week. Um, uh, we've got a few people who have actually increased their donation, which is fantastic. So thank you, thank you, thank you to you as well. Um, so names I'm going to shout out are Jennifer K, Anne B, Clive B, Ian D, Jackie M, David S, Fionn J, Lucy AP, and Courtney G. Um, and the last name I have to do a special thank you to because this person has given us a hugely generous donation, which has topped all the donations we've ever received. So thank you so much for your generosity. Um, and if you uh, haven't supported the project yet, if you're new to watching the show tonight um, and you would like to tip your actors, um, everyone involved in this project does so voluntarily. Um, so if you would like to contribute something, uh, if you head to the Patreon link, which is in the video description, um, you can uh, sign up there and donate, uh, I think as little as uh, £1.20, I think is the minimum uh, that you can give. Uh, but anything you're able to donate to the project is hugely appreciated. Um, and, we, uh, and also we've got some very lovely, exciting, exclusive content coming this week, uh, including an interview uh, and a vlog from one of our actors in the show. So you get to see a little bit behind the scenes if you are signed up to our Patreon. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And re please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon to receive all notifications. Please also share your reactions to the show so far using the hashtag show must go online and follow us at TSMG online live on Twitter and at the show must go online on Insta and Facebook. Thank you so much for that. Sarah, do we have any questions through from our audience? I'm just having a quick look now to Marvelous. see if any is coming through. I think I saw one question that came through actually via Twitter, which was, uh, do you take inspiration from your own previous shows or is it always reinventing the wheel? Uh, and I would say with that, 
Um, the, uh, the short answer is both. We obviously uh, look to our past to inform our future, as Shakespeare would have done himself, uh, but we're also always very keen to try and uh, drive the medium forward as well. So you might have noticed some technological firsts this week. Uh, and we are uh, obviously always trying to make sure that we uh, have new things going on uh, just to keep you guys surprised and delighted, we hope. Um, Sarah, do we have any more questions? Uh, there was one question I just spotted uh, a short while ago, which was, is this the first time, uh, and if you, you probably spotted, that we had two actors from the same household? Before. Yes, yes. Uh, it's uh, not the first time we've had two actors from the same <laughs> household, but it is the first time that we've had two actors from the f same household in the same show at the same time. Uh, we've had uh, several cohabitating actors uh, spreading the good word and getting themselves involved, uh, but this is the first time that they've been able to occupy the same space. Not only that, uh, but both of them have trained at East 15, which has a really significant stage combat component. Uh, and so there was uh, no better opportunity to break the seal uh, and break the fourth wall of Zoom uh, than with that uh, murder of Sinner the Poet, which was uh, really graphic and really affecting and completely by chance. Uh, we had no idea until we were rehearsing that they were in the same house. Uh, and then once they told us that, we had to uh, seize upon that opportunity. Absolutely. Um, wonderful. Do we have any more questions, Sarah, before we go into the second half? Um, I don't, uh, but I did, I did wonder, I don't know if our lovely guest speakers are, um, are around and wanted to, to jump in and share any thoughts from the first half. <laughs> if we have time. We might not have time now. <laughs> That's true. That's true. In, oh, here we are. Hi, oh, Andy. Hello. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, what? Quick question for you then, Andy. What is your? What are you looking forward to most in the second half? With me, oh, blimey, all of it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The suicides are being. Be, oh, have I given it away? <laughs> I hope I haven't spoiled it there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been it really has. It's been so enjoyable so far. It's, Amazing it's acting. Very, very good. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, we, we've watched uh, a number of these before, and it, it's just it's a different level. It yeah, really is. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. And uh, anything interesting, trivia-wise, that you noticed uh, coming through? Uh, because I, I find when I listen to these plays every time, just like a, a different line kind of ticks out to me. Was there anything in particular that you thought was interesting? Uh, um, <clears throat> I thought I thought actually uh, Lucius was was very very good very polished word perfect and obviously, <laughs> obviously very well rehearsed um so yeah kudos to lucy is there although you know the rest of the cast are also super brilliant yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for that. I think that's all we have time for. The second half is about to begin, so I, I can ask you all to retire to our backstage area more, like hopefully with our guest introducers in the post-show discussion, so please do get your questions in. Uh, we are now ready to commence with the second half, so please do make sure that you're uh, liking uh, the video, subscribing to the channel, um, shouting about the show on social, uh, and uh, now please prepare for the second half of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Act 4, Scene 1, A House in Rome. Enter Antony, Octavius, and Lepidus. This many then shall die, their names are pricked. Your brother too must die. Consent you, Lepidus. I do consent. Rick him die, Antony. Upon condition, Publius shall not live, who is your sister's son, Mark Antony. He shall not live. Look, with a spot, I damn him. But Lepidus, go you to Caesar's house, fetch the will hither, and we shall determine how to cut off some charge in legacies. What? Shall I find you here? Or here, or at the Capitol. That is a slight, unmeritable man. Meet to be sent on errands. Is it fit? The threefold world divided. He should stand one of the three to share it. So you thought him, and took his voice, who should be pricked to die in our black sentence and prescription. Octavius, I have seen more days than you. And though we lay these honours on this man to ease ourselves of diverse slanderous loads, he shall but bear them as the ass bears gold to groan and sweat under the business, either led or driven as we point the way. And having brought our treasure where we will, then take we down his load and 
turn him off like to the empty ass to shake his ears and graze in common. You may do your will, but he's a tried and valiant soldier. So is my horse, Octavius, and for that I do appoint him store of provender. It is a creature that I teach to fight, to wind, to stop, to run directly on his corporal motion governed by my spirit. And in some taste is lepidus, but so he must be taught and trained and bid go forth, a barren spirited fellow, one that feeds on objects and arts, imitations, which out of use and staled by other men begin his fashion. Do not talk of him but as a property. And now, Octavius, listen great things. Brutus and Cassius are levying powers. We must straight make head. Therefore, let our alliance be combined, our best friends made, our means stretched, and let us presently go sit in council, how covert matters may be best disclosed and open perils surest answer it. Let us do so, for we are at the stake and bade about with many enemies, and some that smile have in their hearts, I fear, millions of mischiefs. Exeunt. Act 4, Scene 2, a camp near Sardis, before Brutus's tent. Enter Brutus, Lucilius, Lucius, and the army. Titinius and Pindarus meet them. Stand, ho! Give the word, ho, and stand! What now, Lucilius? Is Cassius near? He is at hand, and Pindarus is come to do you salutation from his master. He greets me well. Your master, Pindarus, in his own change or by ill officers, hath given me some worthy cause to wish things done undone. But if he be at hand, I shall be satisfied. I do not doubt but that my noble master will appear such as he is, full of regard and honor. He is not doubted. A word, Lucilius. How he received you, let me be resolved. With courtesy and respect enough, but not with such familiar instances, nor with such free and friendly conference as he hath used of old. Thou hast described a hot friend cooling. Ever note, Lucilius, when love begins to sicken and decay, it useth an enforced ceremony. There are no tricks in plain and simple faith. But hollow men, like horses hot at hand, make gallant show and promise of their mettle. But when they should endure the bloody spur, they fall, their crests, and like deceitful jades, sink in trial. Comes his army on. They mean this knight in Sardis to be quartered. The greater part, the horse in general, are come with Cassius. Hark, he is arrived. March gently on to meet them. Stand ho! Stand ho! Speak the word alone. Stand! 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 Stand. Most noble brother, you have done me wrong. Judge me, you gods! Wrong I mine enemies. And if not so, how should I wrong a brother? Brutus, this sober form of yours hides wrongs, and when you do them... Cassius, be content. Speak your griefs softly. <laughs> I do know you well. Before the eyes of both our armies here, which should perceive nothing but love from us, let us not wrangle. Bid them move away. Then, in my tent, Cassius, enlarge your griefs, and I will give you audience. Penderes, bid our commanders lead their charges off a little from this ground. Lucius, do you the like, and let no man come to our tent till we have done our conference. Let Lucilius and Titinius guard our door. That you have wronged me doth appear in this. You have condemned and noted Lucius Pella for taking bribes here of the Sardians, where in my letters, praying on his side, because I knew the man was slighted off. Wrong yourself to write in such a case. In such a time as this, it is not meet that every nice offence should bear his comment. Let me tell you, Cassius, you yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm to sell and mark your offices for gold to undeservers. I, an itching palm. You know that you are Brutus that speaks this, or oh, by the gods, this speech were else your last. 
The name of Cassius honors this corruption, and chastisement doth therefore hide his head. Chastisement! Remember March, the Ides of March, remember. Did not great Julius bleed for justice sake? What villain touched his body that did stab and not for justice? What shall one of us that struck the foremost man of all this world but for supporting robbers? Shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes and sell the mighty space of our large honors for so much trash as may be grasped thus? I had rather be a dog and bay the moon than such a Roman. Brutus! Bait me not, I'll not endure it. Hey, you forget yourself to hedge me in. I am a soldier, I older in practice, abler than yourself to make conditions. Go oh, to, you are not, Cassius. I am. I say, you are not. Urge me no more, I shall forget myself. Have mind upon your health, tempt me no farther. Way, slight man. <laughs> Is it possible? Hear me, for I will speak. Must I give way and room to your rash collar? Shall I be frighted when a madman stares? Ah, oh, ye gods, ye gods, must I endure all this? All this I more. Fret till your proud heart break. Go show your slaves how choleric you are and make your bondmen tremble. Must I budge? Must I observe you? Must I stand and crouch under your testy humor? By the gods, you shall digest the venom of your spleen, though it do split you. For from this day forth, I'll use you for my mirth. Yea, for my laughter when you are waspish. Is it come to this? You say you are a better soldier. Let it appear so. Make your vaunting true, and it shall please me well. For mine own part, I shall be glad to learn of noble men. You wrong me every way. You wrong me, Brutus. I said an elder soldier, not a better. Did I say better? If you did, I care not. When Caesar lived, he does not have thus moved me. Peace, peace. You durst not so have tempted him. I does not. No. What does not tempt him? For your life you durst not. Oh, do not presume too much upon my love. I may do that, I shall be sorry for. You have done that you should be sorry for. There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass by me as the idle wind, which I respect not. I did send to you for certain sums of gold which you denied me. For I can raise no money by vile means. By heaven, I had rather coin my heart and drop my blood for drachmas than to wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile trash by any indirection. I did send to you for gold to pay my legions, which you denied me. Was that done like Cassius? Should I have answered Gaius Cassius so? When Marcus Brutus grows so covetous to lock such rascal counters from his friends, be ready, gods, with all your thunderbolts, dash him to pieces. I denied you not. You did. I did not. He was but a fool that brought my answer back. And Brutus hath arrived my heart. A friend should bear his friend's infirmities, but Brutus makes mine greater than they are. I do not till you practice them on me. You love me not. I do not like your faults. Oh, a friendly eye could never see such faults. A flatterer's would not, though they do appear as huge as high Olympus. Oh, come, Antony and young Octavius, come. Revenge yourselves alone on Cassius for... Cassius is a weary of the world, hated by one he loves, braved by his brother, checked like a bondman, all his faults observed, set in a notebook, learned and conned by rote, and cast into my teeth. <laughs> I could weep my spirit from mine eyes, 
There is my dagger. And here, here my naked breast, within a heart dearer than Pluto's mine, richer than gold. If thou beest a Roman, take it forth. I that denied thee gold will give my heart. Strike as thou did at Caesar, for I know when thou didst hate him worst, thou lovest him better than thou ever lovest Cassius. Sheathe your dagger. Be angry when you will, it shall have scope. Do what you will, dishonor shall be humor. Oh, Cassius, you are yoked with a lamb that carries anger as the flint bears fire, who much enforced shows a hasty spark and straight is cold again. Has Cassius lived to be but mirth and laughter to his Brutus when grief and blood ill-tempered vexeth him? When I spoke that, I was ill-tempered too. Do you confess so much? Give me your hand. And my heart to Brutus. What's the matter? Have you not love enough to bear with me when that rash humor which my mother gave me makes me forgetful? Yes, Cassius. And from henceforth, when you are over earnest with your Brutus, he'll think your mother chides and leave you so. Let me go in to see the generals. There is some grudge between them. Tis not meet they be alone. You shall not come to them. Nothing but death shall stay me. Oh no, what's the matter? For shame, you generals, what do you mean? Love and be friends as two such men should be. For I have seen more years, I'm sure, than ye. How, how vilely does this cynic rhyme? You hence, Syrah, saucy fellow, hence. Oh, bear with him, Brutus, tis his fashion. I'll know his humour when he knows his time. What should the wars do with these jigging fools? Companion, hence. Away, away, be gone. Lucilius and Titinius bid the commanders prepare to lodge their companies tonight. And come yourselves and bring Masala with you immediately to us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lucius! Lucius, a bowl of wine! <laughs> I did not think you could have been so angry. Oh, Cassius, I am sick of many griefs. Of your philosophy you make no use if you give place to accidental evils. No man bears sorrow better. Portia is dead. Huh? Portia? She is dead. How escaped I killing when I crossed you so? Oh, insupportable and touching loss upon what sickness? Impatient of my absence and grief that young Octavius with Mark Antony had made themselves so strong, for with her death that tidings came. With this she fell distract and her at attendant's absent swallowed fire. And died so? Even so. Oh, ye immortal gods. Speak no more of her. Give me a bowl of wine. In this, I bury all unkindness, Cassius. My heart is thirsty for that noble pledge. Fill, Brutus, till the wine o'er swell the cup. I cannot drink too much of Brutus's love. Come in, Titinius. Welcome, good Masala. Now, sit be close about this taper here and call in question our necessities. Portia, art thou gone? No more, I pray you. Masala, I have received here letters that young Octavius and Mark Antony come down upon us with a mighty power, bending their expedition toward Philippi. Myself have letters of the same tenure. With what addition? That by prescription and bills of outlawry, Octavius, Antony, and Lepidus have put to death an hundred senators. Uh, therein our letters do not well agree. Mine speak of 70 senators that died by their prescriptions. Cicero being one. Cicero one. Cicero is dead. And by that order of prescription, had you your letters from your wife, my lord? No, Miss Allah. 
nor nothing in your letters written of her? Nothing, Miss Alva. That, methinks, is strange. Why ask you? Hear you aught of her and yours? No, my lord. Now, as you are a Roman, tell me true. Then, like a Roman, bear the truth I tell. For certain she is dead, and by strange manner. Why, farewell, Portia. We must die, Miss Olive. With meditating that she must die once, I have the patience to endure it now. Even so, great men, great losses should endure. I have as much of this in art as you, but yet my nature could not bear it so. Well, to our work alive. What do you think of marching to Philippi presently? I do not think it good. Your reason? This it is. It is better that the enemy seek us. So shall we waste his means, weary his soldiers, doing himself offence, whilst we, lying still, are full of rest, defence, and nimbleness. Good reasons must of force give place to better. The people twixt Philippi and this ground do stand but in a forced affection, for they have grudged us contribution. The enemy marching along by them, by them shall make a fuller number up, come on refreshed, new added, and encouraged. For which advantage shall we cut him off, if at Philippi we do face him there, these people at our back? Hear me, good brother. Under your pardon, you must note beside that we have tried the utmost of our friends. Our legions are brimful, our cause is ripe. The enemy increaseth every day. We, at the height, are ready to decline. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or lose our ventures. And with your will go on, we'll along ourselves and meet them at Philippi. The deep of night has crept upon our talk, and nature must obey necessity, which we will niggard with a little rest. There is no more to say. No more. Good night. Early tomorrow we will rise and hence. Lucius, my gown. Farewell, good Masala. Good night to Tinius. Noble, noble Cassius. Good night and good repose. Oh, my dear brother. This was an ill beginning of the night. Never come such division between our souls. Let it not, Brutus. Everything is well. Good night, my lord. Good night, good brother. Good night. Good night, Lord Lucius. Farewell, everyone. Give me the gown. Where is thy instrument? Here in the tent. What? Thou speakest drowsily. Poor knave, I blame thee not. Thou art o'erwatched. Call Claudio and some of my other men. I'll have them sleep on cushions in my tent. Varus and Claudio. Holmes, my lord. I pray you, sirs, lie in my tent and sleep. It may be I shall rise you by and by on business to my brother Cassius. So please you, we will stand and watch your pleasure. I will not have it so. Lie down, good sirs. It may be I shall otherwise bethink me. Look, Lucius, look. Here's the book I sought for so. I put it in the pocket of my gown. I was sure your lordship did not give it me. Bear with me, good boy, I am much forgetful. Canst thou hold up thy heavy eyes a while and touch thy instrument to strain or two? Aye, my lord, I'm please you. It does, my boy. I trouble thee too much, but thou art willing. It is my duty, sir. <laughs> I should not urge thy duty past thy might. I know young bloods look for a time of rest. I have slept, my lord, already. It was well done, and thou shalt sleep again. I will not hold thee long. If I do live, I will be good to thee.
This is a sleepy tune. <laughs> Murderous slumber. Layest thou thy leaden mace upon my boy that plays thee music? Gentle knave, good night. I will not do thee so much wrong to wake thee. <laughs> if thou dost nod, thou breaks thy instrument, I'll take it from thee. <laughs> and good boy, good night. Let me see, let me see. Uh, it's not the leaf turned down where I left reading. Uh, here it is, I think. How ill this taper burns. Ha! Ah, who comes here? I think it is the weakness of mine eyes that shapes this monstrous apparition. It comes upon me. Art thou anything? Art thou some god, some angel, or some devil that makes my blood cold and my hair to stare? Speak to me what thou art. I bid thee. Thy evil spirit, Brutus. Why comest thou? To tell thee thou shalt see me at Philippi. Well, then I shall see thee again. Aye, at Philippi. Why, I will see thee at Philippi then. <sighs> now I have taken heart, thou vanishest ill spirit. I, I, I would hold more talk with thee. Ah! 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 Boy, Lucius, Varus, Claudio, sirs, awake. Claudio. The strings, my lord, are false. Thinks he is still his instrument. Lucius, awake. My lord. Didst thou dream, Lucius, that thou so criedst out? My lord, I did not know that I did cry. Yes, that thou didst. Didst thou see anything? Nothing, my lord. Sleep again, Lucius. Sir Claudio, fellow thou, awake. My lord. My lord. Why did you so cry out, sirs, in your sleep? Did we, my did lord? Did we, my lord? Why? Saw you anything? No, my lord, I saw nothing. Nor I, my lord. Go and commend me to my brother Cassius. Bid him set on his powers betimes before, and we will follow. It shall be done, my lord. Done, my lord. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 1, The Plains of Philippi. Enter Octavius, Antony, and their army. Now, Antony, our hopes are answered. You said the enemy would not come down, but keep the hills and upper regions. It proves not so. Their battles are at hand. They mean to warn us at Philippi here, answering before we do demand of them. That. I'm in their bosoms, and I know wherefore why they do it. They could be content to visit other places and come down with fearful bravery, thinking by this face to fasten in our thoughts that they have courage, but tis not so. Prepare you, generals. The enemy comes on in gallant show. Their bloody sign of battle is hung out and something to be done immediately. Octavius, lead your battle softly on upon the left hand of the even field. Upon the right hand, I keep thou the left. Why do you cross me in this exigent? I do not cross you, but I will do so. They stand and would have parley. Thou fast, Titinius. We must out and talk. Mark Antony, shall we give sign of battle? No, Caesar, we will answer on their charge. Make forth, the generals would have some words. Dare not until the signal. Words before blows. Is it so, countrymen? Not that we love words better as you do. Good words are better than bad strokes, Octavius. In your bad strokes, Brutus, you gave good words. Witness the hole you made in Caesar's heart, crying long live, hail Caesar. Antony, the posture of your blows are yet unknown, but for your words they rob the hybler bees and leave them honeyless. Not stingless, too. Oh, yes, and soundless, too, for you have stolen their buzzing, Antony, and very wisely threat before you sting. Villains, you did not so. When your vile daggers hacked one another in the sides of Caesar, 
You showed your teeth like apes and fawned like hounds and bowed like bondmen, kissing Caesar's feet whilst damned Casca, like a cur behind, struck Caesar in the neck. Oh, you flatterers. Flatterers? Now, Brutus, thank yourself. This tongue had not offended so today if Cassius might have ruled. Come, come, the cause. If arguing makes us sweat, the proof of it will turn to redder drops. Look, I draw a sword against conspirators. When think you that this sword goes up again? Never, till Caesar's three and thirty wounds be well avenged, or till another Caesar have added slaughter to the sword of traitors. Caesar, thou canst not die by traitors' hands unless thou bringst them with thee. Oh, I hope. I was not born to die on Brutus' sword. Oh, if thou wert the noblest of thy strain, young man, thou couldst not die more honourable. Peevish schoolboy, worthless of such honour, joined with a masker and a reveller. Old Cassius still. Come, Antony, away. Defiance, traitors, hurl we in your teeth. If you dare fight today, come to the field. If not, when you have stomachs. <laughs> Why now, blow wind, swell billow and swim bark. The storm is up and all is on the howl. Oh, Lucilius, hark, a word with you. My lord. Uh, Masala. What say you, my general? Masala, this is my birthday, as this very day was Cassius born. Give me my hand. Masala, be thou my witness that against my will, as Pompey was, I am compelled to set upon one battle all our liberties. You know that I held Epicurus strong and his opinion. Now I change my mind and partly credit things that do presage. Coming from Sardis on our former ensign, two mighty eagles fell, and there they perched, gorging and feeding from our soldiers' hands, who, to Philippi, here consorted us. This morning they are fled away and gone, and in their steeds do ravens, crows, and kites fly over our heads, and downward look on us as we were sickly prey. Their shadows seem a canopy most fatal under which our army lies, ready to give up the ghost. Believe not so. I but believe it partly, for I am fresh of spirit and resolved to meet all perils very constantly. Even so, Lucilius. Now, most noble Brutus, the gods stand today friendly that we may, lovers in peace, lead on our days to age. But since the affairs of men rest still uncertain, let's reason with the worst that may befall. If we do lose this battle, then is this the very last time we shall speak together. What are you determined to do? Even by that rule of that philosophy by which I did blame Cato for the death which he did give himself, I know not how, but I do find it cowardly and vile for fear of what might fall to so prevent the time of life, arming myself with patience to stay the providence of some high powers that govern us below. Then if we lose this battle, you are contented to be led in triumph through the streets of Rome? No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou Roman, that ever Brutus will go bound to Rome. He bears too great a mind. But this same day must end the work the Ides of March begun. And whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever, farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, why we shall smile. If not, why then this parting was well made. Forever and forever, farewell, Brutus. If we do meet again, we'll smile indeed. If not, tis true, this parting was well made. Why then, lead on. Oh, that a man might know the end of this day's business ere it come. But it sufficeth that the day will end. And then the end is no. Come, ho, away. Exeunt.
Act 5, Scene 2, The Plains of Philippi, The Battlefield. Enter Brutus and Messala. Ride, ride, Messala, ride, and give these bills unto the legions on the other side. Let them, let them set on at once, for I perceive but cold demeanor on Octavius' wing, and sudden push gives them the overthrow. Ride, ride, Messala. Let them all come down! Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 3, The Plains of Philippi, another part of the battlefield. Enter Cassius and Titinius. Oh, look, Titinius, look! The villains fly! Myself had to mine own turn to enemy! This ensign here it was turning back! I slew this coward and did take it from him! Oh, Cassius! Brutus gave the word too early, who, having some advantage on Octavius, took it too eagerly. His soldiers fell to spoil, whilst we by Antony are all enclosed. Fly further off, my lord, fly further off! Mark Antony is in your tents, my lord. Fly, therefore, noble Cassius, fly far off! Oh, this hill is far enough. Look, look, Titinius. Are those my tents where I perceive the fire? They are, my lord. Titinius, if thou lovest me, mount thy my horse and hide thy spurs in him till he hath brought thee up to yonder troops and there again that I may rest assured whether yon troops are friend or enemy. I will be here again, even with a fort. Oh, Cinderus, get higher on that hill. Fight was ever thick. Regards Titinius and tell me what thou noticed about the field. Day I breathed first, time has come around, and where I did begin, there shall I end. My life is run his compass. Sirrah, what news? Oh, my lord. What news? Titinius is enclosed round about with horsemen that make to him on the spur, yet he spurs on. Now they are almost on him. Now, Titinius! Now some light. He lights too. Tatum. Yeah! In heart they shout for joy. Oh, come down. Behold no more. Oh, coward that I am to live so long to see my best friend Tatum before my face. Oh, hither, Sarah. In Parthia did I take thee prisoner. And then I swore thee, saving of thy life, that whatsoever I did beat thee do, thou shouldst attempt it. Come, now, keep thine oath. Now, be a freeman, and with this good sword that ran through Caesar's bow, search this bosom. Stand not to answer here. Take thou the hilt, and when my face is covered, as tis now, guide thou the sword. <laughs> Caesar, thou art revenged, even with the sword that killed thee. So I am free. It would not so have been, durst I had done my will. Oh, Cassius. Far from this country, Pindarus shall run, where never Roman may take note of him. It is but changed, Titinius, for Octavius is overthrown by noble Brutus's power, and Cassius' legions are by Antony. These tidings will well oh, comfort Cassius. Where did you leave him? All disconsolate with, with Pindarus, his bondman, on this hill. Is not that he that lies upon the ground? He lies not like the living. Oh, my heart. Is not that he? No, this was he, Masala. The Cassius is no more, O oh, setting sun. As in thy red rays thou dost sink to night. So his red blood, Cassius, day is set. The sun of Rome is set. Our day is gone. 
clouds, dews and dangers come, our deeds are done. Mistrust of my success hath done this deed. Mistrust of good success hath done this deed. O oh, hateful error, melancholy's child, why dost thou show to the apt thoughts of men the things that are not? O oh, error, soon conceived, thou never comes unhappy birth, but killest the mother that endangered thee. What? Pandarus, where art thou, Pandarus? Seek him, Titanius, whilst I go meet the noble Brutus, thrusting this report into his ears. I may say thrusting it, for piercing still and darts envenomed shall be as welcome to the ears of Brutus as tidings of this sight. Hi, you, Masala, and I will seek for Pandarus the while. Why didst thou send me forth, brave Cassius? Did I not meet thy friends? And did not they put on my brows this wreath of victory and bid me give it thee? Didst thou not hear their shouts? Thus thou hast misconstrued everything. But hold thee. Take this garland on thy brow. Thy Brutus, <laughs> bid me give it thee, and I will do his bidding. Brutus, come apace, and see how I have regarded Gaius Cassius. By your leave, gods, this is a Roman's part. Come, Cassius' sword, and find Titinius' heart. Where? Where, Messala, doth his body lie? No, yonder, and Titinius, tin, Titinius mourning it. Titinius faces upward. He is slain. Oh, Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords into our own proper entrails. Brave Titinius. Look where he have not crowned dead Cassius. Are two, are yet two Romans living such as these? The last of all the Romans, fare thee well. It is impossible that ever Rome should breed thy fellow. Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius, I shall find time. Come therefore, and to Theso send his body. His funerals shall not be in our camp, lest it discomfort us. Lucilius, come and come, young Cato, let us to the field. Labio and Flavius, set our battles on. Tis three o'clock, and Romans yet ere night, we shall try fortune in a second fight. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 4, The Plains of Philippi, another part of the battlefield. Enter Brutus, Messala, Young Cato, Lucilius, and Flavius. Yes, yes, countrymen, oh yes, hold up your heads! What bastard doth not? Who ah. will go in vain? I will proclaim my name about the battlefield. I am the third Marcus Cato, ho! A foe to the tyrant and my country's friend. I am the son of Marcus Cato. Oh! And I am Brutus. Marcus Brutus, I am Brutus, my country's friend. I have no need for Brutus. <laughs> oh, young and noble Cato, art thou down? Why now thou diest as bravely as Titinius, and mayest be honored, being Cato's son. Yield, or thou diest. Only I yield to die. There is so much that thou wilt kill me straight. Kill Brutus and be honored in his death. <laughs> we must not. A, a noble prisoner! Room ho! Tell Antony! Brutus is taken! <laughs> I'll tell the news. Here comes the general. Brutus is taken! Brutus is taken, my lord! Where is he? Thanks, Antony. Brutus is safe enough. I dare assure thee that no enemy shall ever take alive the noble Brutus. The gods defend him from so great a shame when you find him, or alive, or dead. He will be found like Brutus, like himself. This is not Brutus, friend. 
but I assure you a prize no less in worth. Keep this man safe, give him all kindness. I'd rather have such men my friends than enemy. Go on and see where Brutus be alive or dead and bring us word into Octavia's tent how everything has chanced. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 5, The Plains of Philippi, another part of the battlefield. Enter Brutus, Dardanius, Clytus, Lucius, and Volumnius. Come, poor remains of friends rest on this rock. Elias showed the torchlight, but my lord, he came not back. He is or tain or slain. Sit me down, Clytus. Slaying is the word. It is a deed in fashion. Hark thee, Clytus. But I, my lord, no, not for all the world. Peace then, no words. I'd rather kill myself. Hark thee, Dardanius. Shall I do such a deed? Oh, Dardanius. Oh, Clytus. What ill request did Brutus make to thee? To kill him, Clytus. Look, he meditates. Now is that noble vessel full of grief that it runs over even at his eyes. Come hither, good Volumnius. List a word. What says, my lord? Why this, Volumnius. The ghost of Caesar hath appeared to me two several times by night. At Sardis once, and this last night here in Philippi fields. I know my hour is come. No, not so, my lord. Nay, I am sure it is, Volumnius. Thou seest the world, Volumnius, how it goes. Our enemies have beat us to the pit. It is more worthy to leap in ourselves than tarry till they push us. Good Volumnius, thou knowst that we two went to school together. Even for that our love of old, I prithee, hold thou my sword hilts whilst I run on it. That is not an office for a friend, my lord. Fly, fly, my lord, there is no tarrying here. Farewell to you, and you, and you, Volumnius. Lucius, thou hast been all this while asleep. Farewell to thee too, Lucius. Countryman, my heart doth joy that yet in all my life I found no man but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day, more than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto. So fare you well at once, for Brutus' tongue hath almost ended his life's history. Night hangs upon mine eyes. My bones would rest that have but labored to attain this hour. Fly, my lord, fly! And I will follow. I prithee, Lucius, stay thou by thy lord. Thou art a fellow of a good respect. Thy life hath had some smatch of honor in it. Hold then my sword and turn away thy face while I do run upon it. Wilt thou, Lucius? Give me your hand first. Fare you well, my lord. Farewell. Good, Lucius. Caesar, now be still. I killed not thee with half so good a will. What man is that? My master's man, Lucius. Lucius, where is thy master? Free from the bondage you were in, Messala. The conquerors can but make a fire of him, for Brutus only overcame himself, and no man else hath honour by his death. So Brutus should be found. I thank thee, Brutus, that thou hast proved Lucilius saying true. All that served Brutus, I will entertain them. Fellow, wilt thou bestow thy time with me? Aye, if Messala will prefer me to you. Do so, good Messala. How died my master Lucius? I held the sword, and he did run on it. Octavius, then take him to follow thee. That did the latest service to my master. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All 
the conspirators save only he did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only in the general honest thought and common good to all made one of them. His life was gentle and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. According to his virtue, let us use him with all respect and rites of burial. Within my tent tonight, his bones shall lie, most like a soldier, ordered honorably. So call the field to rest and let's away, to part the glories of this happy day. Exeunt Omnes. Ladies and gentlemen, guys, gals, non-binary pals, please join me. Give yourselves a massive round of applause for a tremendous showing there. Congratulations, one and all. Really, really extraordinary stuff. Thank you so much for that. Wow. What an ending. What a second half. What a play. Well done, everyone. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, Brilliant, brilliant. I'm speechless. I'm speechless. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Of course, uh, as is customary, I'll now introduce you to the cast and crew, starting with Sarah Peachy, our wonderful producer. Hi, I'm Sarah. I am an innovation project manager and actor based in Glasgow. Our associate director, stage manager and master of props, Emily Ingram. Hello, I'm a writer, director and stage manager based in Edinburgh in Scotland. <laughs> Fantastic. And we have a new sound designer for you this week, Adam K. Gibson. Hi, I'm Adam. I'm a sound designer and composer based in London. And Adam has been really pushing the boundaries, as I'm sure you noticed uh, this week. Extraordinary, uh, like mid-scene soundscaping, which we've never been able to pull off before. So that was absolutely delightful. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, and our cast, put together by the incredible Sydney Aldridge casting director. Here they are as Marcus Brutus, Dan Wilson. Hi, I'm Dan, everyone. I'm an actor based in Washington, DC. As Cassius Mistley Rose. Hello, I'm an actor comedian based in um, Brixton. As Mark Anthony, Tom Banton. Hello, I'm an actor and an English teacher based on the west coast of Scotland. As Julius Caesar, Stephen Schnetzer. Hello, I'm Stephen Schnetzer. I'm an actor in New York. As Portia, Sayon Sarvan. Hello, I'm Sayon Sarvan, based in London, and I'm an actor. As Casca, Jeannie Kaminsky. Hi, I'm Jeannie Kaminsky. I'm an actor and producer based in London. As Octavia Caesar, Georgia Andrews. Hello, I'm Georgia Andrews. I am an actor and facilitator based in East London. As Decius Brutus, Nicanor Campos. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am an actor, a director, a writer and teacher in Manila, the Philippines. As Lucius, Emily Beck. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a classic student and actor in training from Newbury. As Calpurnia, Mary Hayes. Hello, I'm, Mar I'm Mari Hayes. I'm an actor based in Atlanta, Georgia. As First Plebeian and Titinius, Michael Downey. Hi, um, I'm an actor, director and writer from New Zealand based in Seoul, South Korea, where it's very late. Really. As Masala and Fifth Plebeian, Corinna Brown. Hi, I'm Karina Brown. I'm an actor based in London. As third plebeian and Morellus, Jess Vince Moyne. Hi, I'm Jess Vince Moyne. I'm an Australian actor and voiceover artist based in London. As fourth plebeian and Pinderus, Matthew Rhodes. Hello, I'm an emerging theatre artist on unceded Musqueam, Squamish and Slave Tooth territory, also called Vancouver, Canada. As Trebonius and Lucilius, Mahadissa. Hi, I'm Mahadissa. I am an acting student in Mississauga. As Flavius and Amelius Lepidus, Russell Proctor. Hello, I'm an actor, writer and teacher in Brisbane, Australia. And our ensemble for this evening, starting first with Emma Zado. Hi, I'm Emma Zado. I'm an actor and writer based between Norfolk and London, England. Andrew Mockler. Hi, I'm Andrew Mockler. I'm an actor musician based in London. Stephen Connery Brown. Hello, I'm an Australian actor based in London. Natalie Winter. Hello, I'm Natalie Winter. I'm an actor, voice artist and director based in East London. Kit Brenton. 
Hi, I'm Kit Brenton. I'm an actor based in London. Robbie Capaldi. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Robbie Capaldi. I'm an actor based in London. And Will Block. Hi, I'm Will Block. I'm an actor director based in Los Angeles, California. And our fantastic swings for this evening, also filling in uh, some extra roles as well. First, Dominic Brewer. Hi, I'm Dominic Brewer. I'm an actor originally from Bristol, based in London. And Hayley Mitchell. Hiya, I'm Hayley Mitchell and I'm an actor from Teesside. And that's everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. What a fantastic show. Really give yourselves pats on the back for that. Really extraordinary. My favourite Shakespeare play brought to life in a medium that, you know, four months ago I never knew existed or certainly never would have thought to use in this way. And it's been fantastic to see you all pushing the boundaries once again, week after week. Um, so if you have any questions for either us or our fantastic guest introducers, Pfizer and Andy, uh, please do get those in and we will be very happy to take them from you. Um, it looks like the applause is coming in thick and fast right now, so we might have to wait for a little while. So I'm going to pad this time by saying, if you haven't done already, like this video, subscribe to the channel, uh, post your reactions using the hashtag show must go online and follow us at TSMG Online Live on Twitter or at the show must go online on Insta and Facebook. Please also consider commemorating your experience this evening with a piece of TSMG merch on our Redbubble store. Or alternatively, if you've decided that you liked it enough to come back next week, please do uh, consider making a contribution to our Patreon. Details of all of these can be found on the uh, YouTube video description immediately beneath uh, what you're watching right now. Uh, that should just about be long enough for some questions to start coming in, I hope. Sarah, have you seen any coming in? Uh, yes, I've had a couple uh, coming in so far, so I've got to ask this one first. Excellent. Firstly. So, uh, very important question for Robbie. Uh, did you grow your beard for the play and then shave off accordingly, or did you commit to it all two days ago? <laughs> I um uh, I, I'm not gonna lie. I've been a bit lax with the old grooming of the face over lockdown because nobody sees me, so I hide here. And then uh, it came up, and I thought, what's more Shakespearean than a beard? And uh, I have enough breaks to run and shave it off, so I had great fun with it. I think Will Will was the first one who called me out on it. <laughs> the it audience was certainly having a wonderful time with it. It was definitely noticed, and definitely one of those lovely Easter eggs that we love to see. Ah, love it. Um, so I've got a question here from uh, Joe Stevenson. Where did you get the idea to let the plebeians participate in Anthony's famous speech? You made the speech much more immediate and helped us hear it fresh. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, second of all, I believe, now I must admit, I did made this discovery actually years ago and did not go back to recheck it before this. So this might be one of those things where you have like a false memory in your head. However, I am given to understand, uh, and it is, it is my current, uh, um, what's the word, my current position, that the first folio punctuation actually puts in either a comma or a dash after the is uh, in and Brutus is an honourable man and it was uh, a theory in a book called Shakespeare's Producing Hand which is now out of print uh, that uh, suggests that uh, it's always worth auditioning a comma as a question mark and if you do that that allows you to uh, look at it as a possibility and the reason for that by the way is that first folio printers would simply run out of punctuation on a printed page if there were many questions and so they might use a comma as a substitute. Uh, and so it's worth auditioning it as a choice. Uh, I auditioned it as a choice for myself uh, when I was just exploring the text for my own personal joy. Uh, and it was something that I found really exciting as a, as a proposition. And so uh, we decided to enact it in this show. And I think everybody did a fabulous job of uh, bringing that to life. Uh, and I agree, I think it was, it was a nice way to um, put a spin on it that nevertheless um, served what I felt the scene was trying to achieve, which was um, about Anthony getting uh, the audience on side from completely against him to completely with him. And call and response is something that you'll see uh, from everything in uh, modern politics. You think the chanting of Yes We Can by Obama, if you want a sympathetic treatment, or uh, chanting at pro wrestling, if you want a slightly more carny treatment, a populist treatment. Uh, call and response is a really powerful rhetorical device. And given that Mark Antony's speech is a masterclass in rhetoric, uh, it seemed like it would be a shame to leave uh, one of those tools unused. So we decided to bring it to life that way. Thank you so much for the question. Back over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, 
So, uh, okay, we've got a couple of ones about some of the gory bits of the show. <laughs> so I'll ask these two uh, back to our, two. Uh, first of all, um, how were the squelchy sounds done? Someone has tentatively asked. So I think that's one probably for Adam. Absolutely, Adam, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, I <laughs> I did what a, a couple of classic uh, film sound makers do, which is just lots and lots of fruit and veg, uh, specifically watermelons and cabbage are two fantastic ones. Um, I didn't couldn't get that many watermelons, so I had to get little melons instead. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. Fantastic. So good. So good. <laughs> And what was the other one? And the other one was, what did you use for the, for, for the gory scenes in terms of kind of props? So specifically the blood. So I think um, probably a good one for Emily, uh, but also if anyone's got any variations on, on the available recipes, it would be fun to share those. Absolutely, yeah. So we'll start with Emily and then we'll open it out. So there's six different Show Must Go Online blood recipes, uh, one of which Dominic Brewer is currently uh, demonstrating in the right-hand corner of my screen slightly ominously. And um, the recipes are ordered in um, in order of what kind of wound your, your character has. So we've got one for sort of gunshot or sort of just dried, uh, sort of kind of clotted wounds. We've got one for really bloody, like arterial wounds. Um, you know, we, we've got it all. Um, there's six different options to choose from and people kind of pick and mix, mix between them depending on what they've got in their kitchen cupboards. And I think it's probably better if the actors uh, tell you what they decide to go for in the pick and mix of blood this week. So uh, over to over to someone else. Absolutely, I'll just chip in quickly to say, I love that after 20 shows, we've established like a Pantone color swatch of blood recipes, it's just amazing. <laughs> over to you actors. I used a mix of uh, beet juice and cornstarch heated lightly, um, which uh, clings to the blade in a nice way, but stinks like nothing else, which, you know, I suppose, I suppose is good for, I suppose is good for putting you in the moment, but I'm definitely gonna need to drink some water after this. Good in a warm summer as well, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to use mine tonight, luckily, but um, I had some ready prepared just in case. Uh, and it's so easy. Mine is, is quite simply uh, golden syrup mixed with red food coloring. And it has a wonderful uh, texture because it runs like blood and it's got a, the right color to it, and it tastes really good, yeah. Mm. 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 <laughs> so we'll leave, we'll leave Dom to his dinner. <laughs> I'm currently covered in ketchup, and I thought that was a good thing for, for, the, for the ending, being covered in blood. Absolutely, if you're in a rush- I'll wash yeah, my face, call, but it was coffee back and to Ribena. Bottom. <laughs> coffee and Ribena, interesting. Yeah. Combo via Emily, thank you very much. Wonderful. Excellent. Any more questions, Sarah? Yes. So um, I'm going to throw another one back to you, actually, Rob. Um, so there was a question, which is, where did the decision come from to have Lucius kill Brutus? Yes, it is Strato in the original text. Strato does not appear to my knowledge. Certainly, I didn't spot him before that final scene. And to me, it felt like a bit of a nothing character to give such an important job to now. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't go back and check the original Plutarch to, to find out if that was a historical detail that Shakespeare was simply representing, as is common in these Roman plays. Uh, instead, uh, I just wanted to make sure that we could um, create an extraordinary journey, really. And Brutus's relationship with Lucius and Lucius's journey through the play are two things that I think are often underserved, but are really delightful dimensions and elements to them. And I think it's one of the it's one of the rare instances where we get to see a, a nurturing side of Brutus because of obviously his, he, him aspiring to be the paragon of Roman sto Stoicism. It's not frequently seen. Uh, we don't know, uh, in, with the context of the play at least, whether um, Brutus and Portia have any children. It's never mentioned. Uh, and so the idea that uh, this uh, servant may be uh, a kind of surrogate of sorts, or certainly an apprentice at the very least, uh, was attractive to me. And in the text, it says that Strato has slept all this while. And of course, the running gag through nine tenths of the show has been Lucius falling asleep. And so it seemed the most inevitable and natural thing in the world, um, especially because the name scans, Lucius, two syllables, Strato, two syllables. It, was, it wasn't doing any damage. Uh, it was only giving us extra pathos for that uh, final moment. So that was why. 
Fabulous. Cool. So I have got a question here for our lovely Mark Anthony. Um, so uh, how did you decide to play the part? Uh, and the person said it was beautifully done seeing you move from tenuous to determined. Well, I mean, it was just a, it was a talk over with um, the wonderful Rob Miles, really. Um, we both sort of approached it from a similar perspective instead of the whole sort of um, Charlton Heston, you know, powerful orator thing. It's all very much couched in in his emotional response to his friend's death, I guess. And so taking that as the sort of the root source was, it seemed like the natural way to do it. And I think when we started um, our sort of session on it on the first day, uh, which I think is available as a little Patreon extra, a little snippet from that, um, it, yeah, we just, we took it from the, the emotion and started sort of working our way up from there to how his emotion grew from trying to, what's the way to, so, to trying to sort of reason with their logic to finding it untenable and taking the audience with them as well. So yeah, it was, it was really good fun to work through, really good workshop. Oh, you did a tremendous job of it, Tom. Seriously, it's, I, yeah, it was. I, I absolutely loved it. I really, really loved it. It's and fun to uh, do. it was, yeah. And from and from the first moment, you know, Tom, Tom's been very nice, g giving me some props there. But I'm going to throw it straight back at you, buddy, because it was, it was all there. It was all there, and it was, you know, we 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 had fun together, kind of fleshing it out and doing some topiary, as it were, to make the shape yeah. and images as clear as possible. Um, but uh, it was, it, you know, the, the prep that you'd put in before we started together uh, really shone through and uh, maximum respect to you for that. Really, really awesome. Really awesome. Sarah, back to you. Thanks. So I've got a question here for our lovely guest speakers. So Pfizer and Andy, um, someone has asked, what has jumped out uh, for you from viewing the production? What's the what, sorry? Uh, what, what's jumped out um, from viewing the production? <laughs> Oh, blimey. Um, well, it's, I, I think that the whole thing of going online, um, because it's, it's such a new and fresh way of doing things, it's really innovative. Um, and I know we, we interviewed recently uh, Nick Bilber, who's been, he's been doing this with some Palestinian kids for, for a while. Um, and again, that, that was the, sort of the, the first in, intro for me, really. Um, but I, th I think the whole medium of it is just, it's, to be honest with you, with so many actors, it's such a technical job. Hands, hands, you know, yeah. hats off to to you for, for doing it. It's it's brilliant. It really is. Yeah. Um, I could, I wouldn't touch you with a badge pole. <laughs> 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 I, I think you've done an amazing job. I really do. It's 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 just tremendous. Very synchronized, and you know how handing things from one screen to the yeah. other. It's just brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I really all, enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. All, all the all those devices. It's yeah. you know and. Um, Again, you know, tremendous job by the actors to, again, with this medium, bringing somebody into that, it's yeah. such a hard job. When you've got a stage, you've got, a, you've got the audience there, you know, but yeah. this is, it's so different, but you really, you know, um, you're drawn into it and it's, it's just, just great, really is. Love the sound effects. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely wow uh, I'd, I'd love to know from both of you Pfizer and Andy uh, if you've got a favorite uh, scene moment or line from the play yeah well the murder, the murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's you, you know we mentioned at the start of it that um the the, the sort of vulturism and dipping their hands in yeah, it, you know? Yeah. It reminds me of, of jackals pulling their face out of a carcass and it's filthy. It really is, it's, yeah. it's just repulsive. But also, I, of, of course, Mark Antony's speech, it's, you oh. know, it's, it's a killer. Yeah, but I also like when Cassius died. That was really good too. <laughs> the, yeah, going on to the ground. Yeah, that was really good. <laughs> oh, yeah. so good. <laughs> Thanks, <Yeah>. guys. <laughs> Love it, love it so much. It's it's one of those where as, as soon as I start with this question, I just end up saying the whole play. <laughs> <laughs> so many great moments. Yeah. Uh, back to you, Sarah. Uh, so actually building on front the mention of Anthony's speech, I have a question for our plebeians. Um, so at which point in Anthony's speech were you fully on side and was it a different point for each of you? Uh, I'll start. <laughs> um, great question. I think that it's sort of a... Uh, 
how I kind of experienced it was that it's kind of the tides coming in and you don't really realize that you're in the water until you're fully in it. Um, and so I kind of found that it wasn't a, oh, you made this one point and now I've turned around, which was kind of what I found with Brutus, but with Antony that it was kind of like, you keep saying this, you keep doing this, you keep doing this. And then suddenly I'm like, yeah, let's fucking, or yeah, let's, uh, let's kill some people. Let's riot. Um, you know, that it wasn't that I turned, but I didn't, I don't know if I had a turning point. Um, but I do know that when we see the body that just hits hard. Absolutely. I think that that so well speaks to Pfizer and Andy's point, doesn't it? About um, the body and uh, the savagery of, of the act itself of the assassination. And what I love actually in that scene is when Anthony comes in, you know, that they're, they're doing all the steeping of hands and celebrating what an amazing thing they've done. And they see this as this noble deed. And then Anthony walks in and, and to the conspirators completely reframes what they look like. Uh, and what the actual scene, uh, the emotions that the scene is going to evoke. And it's so good that we get to see him explain that to them first. And then that seed is in his head so he can call back to it then during the actual oration scene. Uh, because he already knows how powerful it is. It's so, so well structured, so well written. Any, any other plebeian journeys? Well, second plebeian wasn't there, but... She turned her cars and went there. She was listening to <laughs> Yes. So, so what was what what was uh, Cassia saying while all this was going on? <laughs> all sorts of mischief. All sorts. <laughs> <laughs> That leads neatly on actually to, uh, not, not really a question, but uh, just an invitation from our audience. They'd really like to hear from Dan and Mistley about the tent scene uh, and just the process that you guys went through to create that extraordinary relationship that was uh, played so beautifully through that scene. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rob, and, and thank you for the question. Um, you know, uh, it's such a quick process, right? And so you sort of... Um, you jump in and you deal with all the tech and all the, the Zoom things. And for me, this was my first time uh, doing that format. So, um, and then you try to get down to sort of the, the, the meat of what's going on between these people in their lives. And, and I feel like that, that was at least uh, for my journey, I won't speak for Miss Lee, of course, but, but uh, you know, that we sort of nailed the technical pieces of it. Um, and then we were able to go back over it uh, ourselves outside of rehearsal and say, okay, so like, who, are, what is this, this, this really sibling relationship and um, where does it start in the play? Uh, and then, and then by the time we get to that scene, where do we get to and, and, and what are the pieces, you know, I think there's so much love in between these two characters that is so often not seen uh, in this play. And, and I think that was one thing that we really tried to, to nail it on. Uh, Ms. Lee, anything for you? Yeah, I think just that we were looking at where are they similar, where are they different, and why do they need each other? And I think that allows them to work well. I think, um, Dan, you were talking about the fact they're almost um, psychic with each other. They have a language together. But I think especially in that scene, um, I think Cassius sees what a good man Brutus is and feels so utterly ashamed but cannot vocalize that which is why it keeps those it's those arguments isn't it where you know you're wrong but you cannot admit it yeah yeah and likewise um you know once once brutus sort of unloads all of this on cassius and and part of it is what cassius has done and part of it is that portia his wife has just died um and and we made a discovery that uh once cassius pulls out his dagger and threatens to to kill himself i think it hits brutus oh god this is the last person who is left alive that I truly love. Um, the other two I have literally driven to either murder or suicide. Um, it's on me. And so to, to the prospect of doing that to the only person left who I think Brutus feels really knows Brutus um, is it, it kind of makes him realize, oh my God, so much that has to do with Portia, not with Cassius. And how can I do without this person? You know, I think we really need each other. Um, yeah. So good, so good. Ah, I could listen to this all night, quite frankly. Love it, love it. Thank you so much for that both. 
Um, uh, just, just to say as well, Miss Lee, I'd love to hear from you on, uh, on Act 1, Team 2, actually, but you, you have a hell of a job um, pretty much at the start of the play, um, setting the entire universe <laughs> that uh, this play exists in, and that, that is a big uh, burden to shoulder, uh, and I thought you did so effortlessly, and I thought the, the storytelling through that uh, had so much different shape and dimension and w was just incredible. Um, how, how was it for you navigating through a scene which is almost a, a monologue with breaks? Um, it, was, it was interesting because I... It's that thing of, like, you read about Cassius and everyone's like, oh, he's really manipulative, he's really like this and that. And I was like, well, yes, he is, but they all are. That it's everyone is just using you know different diplomatic skills and I was like I think Cassius is actually he sees a wrong that's happening and it needs to be fixed and he cannot it I think he really fundamentally believes that what is going to happen with Caesar is just wrong and it has to not happen and he knows that Brutus is virtuous um, and we, again, with that relationship, he knows that Brutus is the person to go for because they're sort of yin and yang. Like, I think Cassius is the ends justifies the means. And he knows that he can be the bad guy and do the, you know, he can get his hands dirty, but Brutus is the rightful person to lead the charge. So it sort of all slots together, I think, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, they complete each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So good, so good. Sarah, back to you. Hi, so um, I have got a couple of technical questions. Um, one of them, uh, which actually is probably more of a casting uh, sort of response, but how do we manage the ghost sequences? Of course, you know, we, we had a very talented actor do the ghost sequences before, so um, yeah. Rob. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's uh, it's it's rare to find two people that can turn semi-transparent uh, over the course of a uh, and and you know we did we did we did reach out to Tiffany at one point when uh, you know Stephen had some performance anxiety it wasn't quite coming through in the way they wanted so we were like well do we need to get Tiffany back to do this and then he was like you're not taking Caesar off me <laughs> and then he just went semi-transparent and from there on it was it was just beautiful it was beautiful yeah yeah so. Uh, is, it, is that how you remember it, Stephen? Have I got that right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Nobody's taking that moment away from me. <laughs> Specialist skills. <laughs> exactly that, yeah. Mark it on your CV. <laughs> um, and I've got another question actually for Adam. Uh, so someone was asking about the sound cues and how we basically kind of set them up and getting over things like zoom lag so sort of the technical side of, of hearing those sound effects uh yeah so at its core um i'm using a software called qlab which is used pretty much universally now in all theaters big west end theaters all that sort of stuff um it's great uh it's basically just allows me to put sounds uh, and can just group them together the way anywhere i want to um allows me to put a bit of time on the like a bit of a delay on a cue or whatever. It's it's just so, there's so much you can do with it. Um, and then all I'm doing just to combat the lag is a really good internet connection. Um, I've, I've had to run a, for tonight, I've had to run a cable to my router, which is in three rooms that way. Um, and then it's just going straight out of QLab into Zoom via uh, a Zoom audio interface. So actually with, on a good connection, it's actually really good quality uh, and I was actually quite surprised at how well the, the quality works out over Zoom to be honest. <laughs> Absolutely mate and for whatever reason and this was kind of an accidental discovery wasn't it during rehearsal we can underscore things now. Yeah I think as long as we uh, keep an eye on it this was kind of my first time because this is my first time going over this is like in t as, as, a, uh, as a way to view a show and to work on a show this is my first time to do that and uh, yeah, I think as long as we just keep an eye on the the levels and keep an eye on the dialogue and stuff like that, and um, I, I was I was occasionally popping on and off the the actual YouTube stream as well to make try and check, and I think Rob might have been doing the same as well. So um, that sort of thing, yeah. <laughs> oh well, it's a hell of a debut, mate, for a for a new medium. Really well done, really really well done. Sarah, do we have maybe one more question to finish? 
Um, yes. So, okay, I've got a couple actually that I'll throw over back to you, <laughs> Rob, to finish on. First of all, a quick one. Um, when will the Shakespeare deck be back in stock? Oh God, I've still got to pay the supplier to get the printing done. It's been on my to-do list this week, but I've been a bit busy, weirdly. Uh, so hopefully I'll get it done tomorrow. That'll be a seven day um, uh, turnaround time. So they should be around by uh, Hamlet. So it should be back in stock for Hamlet's, fingers crossed. Uh, thank you for asking. Next. <laughs> Um, and the uh, what I'll make is the last question, uh, which actually I'll start with you because it was it was asked to you, but it would be nice to maybe open it up to um, to others in the cast and Definitely. crew. Um, so the question is, why is this your favourite play, Rob? Oh God, no! This is supposed <laughs> to be a fast one. Um, it's my favourite play for for many reasons, and I can't get into them all now. Maybe I'll do a Patreon exclusive where I will talk in detail about why it's my favourite play. Um, I think it's that the whole, the whole is greater than the sum of the, I'll start again. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts and all of the parts are cracking. Um, and it's, it's a play about language. It's a play about um, love between friends. Uh, and I think that's something that I've responded to actually uh, really powerfully through all the plays that we've done is whenever you see that um, uh, kind of, non-romantic but nevertheless palpable love between friends. Uh, I think that's something that existed uh, or was allowed to be expressed much more in Shakespeare's time than maybe it is nowadays, thanks toxic masculinity. Um, I think whenever we get to see that and we get to see that lived um, large in a play like this, I, I just think it's, it's a magnificent and extraordinary thing. And I think Unfortunately, it's incredibly relevant. Uh, I, I know that's something that's important to some people with uh, theatre. Uh, I mean, for me, I think all of them are relevant because they all carry universal themes. Uh, but unfortunately, right now, this one feels dangerous because of how close to our own reality it is. Um, and I think what is good about it is that it shows through the character of Brutus that compromising your integrity and stooping to their level does not lead to good things. Uh, I'll open that out now to everybody else, if anybody else has anything uh, that they'd like to say about oh. why this might be their favourite or, uh, if not their favourite, why they like the play in general. Rob, I, I, I noticed that one of the things you really seem to enjoy whilst directing this show is being able to call a large number of the cast plebs and not have that uh, come back to you. Well, I'm I find a pleb the language myself, very so. clarifying. I find it um, really direct um, and really accessible. I also, the, the political themes are so universal, they apply all the time. Yes, they definitely apply now, but the kind of complexity of the Machiavelli is, uh, is so, again, clarifying in this play. Um, it's, so I, right. I think it's my favorite. I think it's my favorite also, Rob. <laughs> yes, think, mate, absolutely. Yeah, I think it might be my favorite. I've said this to Rob before, um, among others. Um, I studied some ancient history, so it hits multiple geek boxes at the same time. And um, I think it's really beautiful. It's really sad because I fundamentally believe they were doing the right thing. <laughs> they were just too late. Um, and uh, also, I think that it takes off and it goes like a train and it's amazing. Love it. Anyone else? I'll, I'll uh, just, just... No, no, take it away. Please. I was just going to say, for me, the, the first half reads like this intense spy thriller, you know, conspiracy, backdoor kind of, oh, and then and Caesar doesn't see it coming and, um, and you have all this nuance and then like pretty much after the moment that Caesar's killed, it then becomes, at least to my reading or my viewing, this kind of almost psychological exploration of like, you know, how does this help anyone? Does it? And, and who and who, who really doesn't benefit? And then, you know, all the conspirators by the end of the play are either dead or they've completely broken down uh, psychologically. And, and we see just what a, a deleterious effect it has on the people who committed this. Um, I'm sure I could say more, but I'll leave it there. 
<laughs> Matt Rhodes. Uh, in prep for uh, the play, I read a, a big book about like just all about uh, Shakespeare's plays. Um, and one of the things that they said about this one was that it is kind of written to straddle two times that it's it's very much based in ancient Rome, but it's also very much based in Shakespeare's contemporary world. Um, and it does such a great job at constantly bridging those. Um, and so I think I'm also a huge history nerd and I love the history, um, but I also find it to be, as Rob says, such a dangerous play because it's, I think it was made to be written for now. Yeah, I think in the effort of bridging 400 years, he, he bridged, much further than that uh, and I think it's fascinating that Stephen talked about Machiavellianism uh, in reference to this play and talked also about how transparent the language is and of course Machiavelli wrote the prince in common Italian uh, because it was actually there so that everyone could understand the mechanisms of power and I feel like this play does a, a very similar job and completes a very similar task. Um, marvellous that's all we've got time for I'm afraid everyone so thank you so much for joining us uh, and please do tune in next week for our season three finale and all alumni as you like it one of the uh, most fun and joyous of the pastoral comedies thank you so much please remember like subscribe get merch do the patreon and we will see you next week thank you so much and good night <laughs>